Um, and in the afternoon, I showed you the an RGA code and how these parameters affect the result, and basically the difference between binary coded GA and real coded GA. So that that was pretty obvious. That if you have a real a set of real variable uh, variables, it's better to use a real coded GA, right? Because then you don't have those binary mappings and all that stuff that we talked about. Uh, we also looked at the differential evolution, which is another real parameter evolutionary methods, and then particle swarm. Of course, there are many, many extensions of those methods because since 95, all these uh, algorithms uh, people have been working. So last 20 years, there's a lot of development, and I'm just, I just gave you an overall idea. So if you're interested in any of those, you have to go into the respective literature and look at it. Uh, here, I'm just giving an overall an overview of the whole thing. So next one in my list is the CMAES. Okay, this is very popularly used for real parameter optimization, uh, particularly if you are anticipating that there are not many optima. Okay, so this would be a very good competitor to any classical method, CMAES. So the full form is covariance matrix adaptation based evolution strategy. I haven't told you evolution strategy yet, but I, I'm going to tell you later, a little later. But this whole structure here is very carefully designed, okay, algorithm. Like someone was asking me that we could look at uh, some of the variable reductions. Uh, if we have 100 variables, can we figure out that these 50 variables are correlated and uh, near, near the optimum, and can we then reduce the dimension? So this is one such method where um, what it's done is that um, you start with start with an, uh, a number of points, and then I'm showing you here with one point, and even, even uh, when you run it after a few iterations, you can track the best point or some of the best points, let's say the top 5% of the points or something, and then you go and track and come to certain number of iterations, and then you analyze these solutions. What are the properties of these good solutions? Okay? Uh, is there some correlation among the variables? Okay? So once you do that, so one of the ways to do this is sort of like PCA, like principal component analysis that can give you uh, if they're lined up in some linear fashion. Uh, you could also do a nonlinear, uh, nonlinear kind of coreentropy or other kinds of methods for that to identify the relationship between variables that exist in good solutions. So this is what you do. You stop at this point and then you analyze your populations of good points and now come up with some principal directions that if you that your solutions are kind of lined up so other dimensions orthogonal to these principal directions you try to freeze you try, try to not go because those are not interesting regions so then your search space kind of reduced your search dimension so you think of a three dimensional space like if you have x1 x2 x3 after some iterations you found all your solutions are lined up on a plane okay then you only need to search along the plane. You don't have to search away from the plane. So that's what this does. And then your creation mechanism, like they are not doing crossover mutation, but mutation is something they do. So the mutation is then only allowed along that plane. So you'll be creating good solutions using that problem information. So this is what is CMA, yes. But then there are a lot of details of how they do these things. Because of the analysis procedure, which involves matrix inversions, it requires about an n cube where n is the number of variable operations. So it's a little slow, uh, but then you are actually utilizing the information stored in the points. Um, we utilize it in recombination and mutation operator in a GA in a different way, but this is more direct. Uh, and so that's why this is more successful uh, than the standard vanilla genetic algorithm kind of methods. But then you realize that if you have multimodality, if you have a if you have a multimodal landscapes, you will probably not see all your points lined up along a plane because around one optima, they may line up in some way. Around another optima, they may line up in a different way. So if you have the whole population which is covering different peaks, you will not get such nice correlated <coughs> information. <coughs> so then they come up with some kind of clustering method. They say, OK, can we say that for this optima, what are the subpopulation? For another optima, what are the subpopulations? And they can do independently such uh, analysis. So you independently move into different different peaks. Okay, uh, so these are some latest developments on CMAS. 
but this is as I said one of the uh, very good algorithms when you have not much uh, multimodality, but they have methods for multimodal uh, problem handling as well. Uh, these are rotation invariant. So, if your if your function is kind of rotated in some manner uh, shifted uh, because you are analyzing uh, the relationships in the variables it does not matter if you rotate them you just get a different plane, but you are anyway identifying the plane um, with that order n cube analysis. So, so it is invariant, but many of the algorithms um, uh, that I talked about may be they are dependent on if you rotate the function, the properties are not changed, but uh, the relationship among the variables can become more uh, tight and in that case those algorithms may fail, but this one has, has the ability to solve those problems as well. Okay, I am not showing you these comparisons at all, so I will just skip all these things. Uh, here my idea is to just give you an overview of uh, what are the things and, and name of the algorithm, so that later on you can go and search for them. Evolution strategy, I would like to spend a little bit of more time, because this was developed along at the same time of the GA okay, and evolutionary programming. Uh, as I said, this was developed in Germany by Reckenberg and Schwefel uh, back in 1975, but they started working from early 60s. Um, uh, Reckenberg had a book uh, in 19, uh, 1975 to 80 around that time, it was mainly written in German in the beginning, then it was translated in English. Um, they start with a very simple evolution strategy called 1 plus 1 evolution strategy. So, the first one means the number of parents, which is just one parent, and second one means the number of child created from the parent. So, 1 plus 1 means one parent creating one child. So, that kind of an algorithm. So, there is no population in this evolution strategy. You have one random point you start, and you do a mutation to, do, to it using a Gaussian distribution like we talked about yesterday, right? you can do a Gaussian distribution and you create a point in the vicinity of the parent. So, you have a child and you have a parent now, then you compare the two by doing function evaluations, constraint violation all that. If you see that the child is better, then you move to the child. If the parent is still better, you throw the child and create another child using the same distribution and keep on doing this process. So, this is simply 1 plus here, 1 plus 1. Why plus? Because you are comparing both parent and the child together and or, or one with the other and then you are deciding which is better. Okay. So, it is a very simple algorithm, but their initial studies were not done on computer and that was one of the very unique thing about evolution strategy, early evolutionary strategies is that they were all solved experimentally. Let me explain. Um, so, let us say, so this is one of their setup. Okay. They still have some of these setups in Berlin. So, if you are going there, uh, there are some other people working now. So, you can you can try to talk to them and see if you can visit them. Very nice lab. Um, so, let us say that the water is coming through this pipe okay, and it has to be turned by 90 degrees and has to go in that pipe. So, what do we do usually? The usually, there is a one quarter of a circle elbow. These are available in the market. You just connect it. right? So, back in 65, okay, they did this, they wanted to study is this quarter of a circle is the right, right shape. Uh, obviously, there should be a goal. What is the goal then before you say this is the right shape and not the correct, not the right one. So, their goal was that I want to have minimum pressure loss. Obviously, the water is moved in a 90 degree, so it is going through constricted passage. You are not allowing it to go straight, so there will be some pressure loss. right? but I want to minimize that pressure loss. So, that is where the optimization come in, comes in, right? I want to minimize. So, what shape I should have, so that my pressure loss is minimum. Okay. These days, you can go to any kind of fluid mechanic CFD solver and you can pose this problem on a CFD and maybe after two days, you can hook it up with an optimization, it will give you the shape. I am not sure if anybody has done it, maybe some people have done it already for, for this problem just to verify. But they said, no, we are going to do it experimentally, because the CFD, which at that time CFD was in, in, in their infancy, right? Uh, but um, any of those things assumes a lot of things, that there is no friction in the pipe wall and the fluid behaves in a Newtonian manner, so there are certain properties of those. They may not be valid when you have water coming with some dissolved salts and everything, it may not be valid, right? So, they said, okay what you see is what you get kind of experiment, right? So, you, you actually pass water through the pipe 
And when it bends, you actually measure how much was the pressure at the inlet, how much is the pressure on the outlet. And the difference is what you minimize. So what they do, they started with a, a shape that is quarter of a circle, which you think is, is a good solution for this problem or a popular solution for this problem. Then they had one, two, three, four, five, six. Six places on the bend. So this is a flexible hose pipe they put. Six places they can either pull or push that flexible pipe. So now you will deviate from this circular, circular shape, right? It can be any shape that you can get. So the default is 0 when it is like a semicircle or sorry, quarter of a circle. If you push or pull, there will be minus or plus. So that's your decision variable, six variables. At each place, you have to decide how much to push or how much to pull. You can decide push can be plus, pull can be minus or other way around, but you decide. And now to start with, you have a solution with all zeros, zero, 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 six zeros. That's your starting solution because that gives you the quarter of a circle. Now you pass water and measure it when the pressure developed after some time, you measure input and input pressure and output pressure and that's your fitness to this solution. So fitness is coming by experiment. Is that clear? There is no mathematical computation. There is not even any computer hooked up at this point. Okay. Now that's your parent. Now you take that 0, 0, 0, 0, you can be either minus or plus at each place. Now you do a normal distribution around this point. So it will be a, a multi-normal distribution, right? Multinomial distribution actually. So you create a perturbation to that by using some standard deviation that they have ways to do. So you may get first 0 can become minus 0.1 centimeter, next one can become plus 2 centimeter or whatever you can, when you perturbed you get a thing. Then you go and physically change those things. Pull, so there is scale over there, you can pull and push it and set it up and pass water again to that new solution and then you get the fitness again. So fitness is every time you have to go and set it up and do it. When I went and visited, they had computerized everything. So there are controllers and everything put on each of them and they are running it from a computer. So every solution is, but still water is passed for evaluation purpose, but moving push and pull stuff is done through computer. That's possible, right? Okay, so then, so each run used to take a week for them to do, okay, because it's physically you have to go and set it up. At the end, they found this as a result. It's, it's deviating from this, that this is, this is the inlet, the water comes and instead of just starting the bend, you let it go for a while and then take a sharp bend, you actually overshoot little bit and come down. So basically this part should be tangent, this here should be tangent, which is also here, but the shape here is interesting that you are, it's not, it's not the quarter of a circle, you have to go bend it up. Once they get such things, then they go into the mechanics of it and then they could explain why this is going to happen. Okay? Now I'm not sure if anybody has replicated it through uh, computer simulations to see whether this comes up. There may be some uh, deviation from this because this is the exact result because the pressure drop is actual. Okay? There is no assumption here. Right? So this is the nice thing. And the other interesting thing is you can parallelize it, number of solutions. You could deal with population or parallelize it just by stacking up pipes like this. You're stacking up pipe and for every pipe there is a push and pull mechanism. So multiple solutions can be simultaneously um, evaluated. Okay? So if I have 10 population size, I want to do now a GA, all I have to do is 10 such pipes I have to put and each of them is push pulled, individually controlled and I can go to the next generation and so on and so forth. Is that clear? So that's, that's a very nice thing. Unfortunately, this is time consuming, a lot of efforts are needed, not many people are doing these things. but these evolutionary algorithms are so flexible, you can even go down to do experimental optimization. Then they continued with a complete 180 degree turn. Okay, again, you have push-pull stuff. So they start with the semicircle and this is what they get. So the reason for doing this thing is they get a very similar result. You see this one also overshoots and then comes down. This one overshoots and come down. So these two experiments gave them confidence that this is probably, there is a reason why this happens. So they were able to convinced by taking into account the non-linearities and, and, the, and the roughness inside the pipe and everything into account. Okay? I have seen this kind of thing um, done on an engine 
on a automobile engine in Italy. Uh, so there are a lot of controllers, <coughs> valves, how much to open, you know, how much uh, petrol to get in, how much air, and all that stuff. Uh, they were automatically controlling by using a computer, and there is a GA that's running. So if you get into that lab, it's constantly running. So there's a lot of noise. These engine is constantly running, but along the way generations are going on so it's changing it's changing the valve position it's changing the the intakes of petrol and everything in a different way and eventually after running for about 7 8 hours it's going to tell them this is the best combination where you get maximum power out of the engine so there was a lab in italy which i visited uh, they were doing that again about 20 years ago so um, some of these things are pretty old but so the positive things about this is that you don't have to assume anything. You're just exactly optimizing the real thing. So whatever you get is the result of that. That's a positive thing. But the flip side is time consuming. You got to have all these gadgets to be able to control and everything. So, But if you can do that for a problem, some problems it could be really beneficial and not so effort, effort uh, giving. And then you can possibly do it over those, right? And some of the things which doesn't exist, you cannot even do. For example, if you're designing something for the first time, um, you can't do these kind of experiments. Or you can, you can fabricate lots of those things and then figure out. But these are good for control systems problems or something that's uh, like the water one, which can be easily set up in an experiment. Okay. When they started to look into the GA literature, because they were all doing one plus one for a long time, when they started to look at uh, they realized that they could do a population version of this. Okay, uh, so they could do mu comma lambda or mu plus lambda evolution strategy. I'd like to differentiate the two. So mu comma lambda is right here. So you have mu parents now instead of one parent. Okay, from the mu parent you create lambda offspring by using mutation. So there is no crossover at this point. So you have you have mu parents, each one of them you go one by one, and from each parent they create about five to six uh, offspring by using the normal distribution. So their lambda is that's why much bigger than mu. Okay. Now that you have created so many, you evaluate them and then choose the best mu of them because lambda is usually five times bigger than mu. So you keep top mu of them, that becomes your new population, it comes here and you continue in this loop. Okay, go ahead. Um, here, no selection. You're, oh, over here you mean? No, no, this is just uh, enumerative. So the top, the top, so you've got let's say, here you have 10, here you've got 50, 50 you've created. So take the top 10. So you sort them according to fitness. And the top 10 you take and call it the new parent. There is no elite preservation here because elite preservation is in the, the next algorithm. This algorithm, you are not combining parent with offspring. So there is no elite preservation. If there is a good one here, say let's say uh, there is a best one here and the best one here is not even close to that, but you will lose that best because you are not including it to compare with the offspring to get the new. That's done here, mu plus lambda. So this is your mu, and then this is your lambda created the same way. Now you come take the mu, mu and lambda is put together, and then the top 10, uh, top mu is selected here. So if this is 10, this is 50, you've got a 60 population now, and take the top 10. So if anything was good in parent, which, which is better than even all the offsprings, that will pass on. So that's the elite preservation. This one doesn't have elite preservation, but this one is uh, elite preservation has introduces some kind of uh, greediness, right? Because your parent, see, every time if this is a super individual you have here, one of them is let's a super individual, that means it's very difficult to get something even close to it. You accidentally get into something very good. Now this is this will be here, and these are not as good as that, so this will continue. Come back here again. Maybe it will not be able to do. So then you'll have, you'll have um, another copy because if this is a good one, if you're creating an offspring around it, maybe that's also a good one. So you have it here, and since you're taking this population here, that one also goes, this one also goes. 
Okay? So, now you are going to have lots of points very quickly uh, around that super individual. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So, this one um, is this one will work very well if you have a um, unimodal type of problem because you want you want a greedy algorithm to really go and climb the hill. But if you have a multimodal problem, then this algorithm can converge prematurely near the best solution. Okay, so in that case, this method will be very good, the top one because um, you are not carrying the top top the best individual. So there is a scope for other individuals to grow as well. Uh, but once in a while, uh, I mean, even if you not put it into this, you should keep external archive to just keep the best one. You should not get uh, lose the best one ever because if you from here till the last generation, if you have not got anything good, you should at least declare that best one as your as your final solution. So you should preserve it somewhere. So it's plus because you are combining mu plus lambda. That's how you can remember it, and this is mu comma lambda because you are not including the parent. So, it is just the opposite of plus is comma in, in their parlance. Okay? Is that clear? So, there is no recombination. Uh, sorry, this, this method was uh, not developed after seeing the GA. This method was developed after they did 1 plus 1. They realized they could do population based. Uh, later on, they realized that we do in genetic algorithm, we do recombination. So, they could also do recombination because they have a population. But before we do that, uh, an important thing in important thing in this operation is this mutation operator because that's the only search operator, right? So they have a Gaussian distribution around a point. So the standard deviation of the Gaussian distribution is very important. Okay, if you use a large standard deviation, uh, you will not be able to focus. If you use very small, then you are not be able to diversify and find new good solutions. So you need to make a good compromise. So, they really make it a big deal of how to set the sigma, the standard deviation of the Gaussian distribution. They did a lot of theory on two models. One is called the sphere model, which is a simple function. It is sum of x i square. So, it is a quadratic function. You really do not need a GA to solve it as I said, but all their theories are based on that because that is a very simple function to do theory as well. And then they had a corridor model, which means that um, only one of the variables it is the function value reduces, reduces in and actually the infinity at the minus infinity the optimum. And the other variables they are all restricted, there is a variable boundary. So, you can think of like a like a duct, a square duct okay, where the two dimensions x 2 and x 3 are, are limited with bounds and the x, x 1 is just goes on forever. And there is a slight slope, so as you are going in the positive x direction you are improving your function. So, it is a very simple function again to look at, uh, but they did a lot of theory on that functions on these two functions they come up with what should be the optimal mutation strength. They call the sigma as the mutation strength, okay? the variance they call the mutation strength. So, they came up with an optimal mutation strength. Um, that optimum when they found turned out to be a number that is very close to 0.2 then they came up with this one fifth success rule. Okay? Uh, so, the what is one fifth is that, so this is still used in many ways. Um, so, it is an adaptive mutation strength. Okay? Mutation strength is not fixed right from the beginning till then as we do in a genetic algorithm usually. So, um, they are keeping track of how many mutations they are doing okay? and then when they do so, let us say they do n mutations, n could be let us say 20, I am just giving an example. So, let us say I, I, I have done 20 mutations and I am keeping track of when I have done the mutation every time, do I have an improved child from the parent that I have mutated. So, I have got a point I am going to mutate and I have got the mutated child. Is the mutated child better than the parent? If one fifth or more offsprings were better, so that means if I have done 20, 4 or more one fifth of 20 is 4, right? 4 or more if the, you found a better child offspring um, than the parent, then you increase the mutation strength. Okay? Remember Nelder and Mead search, the very first algorithm for the multivariable we talked about where after reflection, they make an expansion. It is the same thing. So, if you land it up in a good region, expands, explore it a bit more. So, that was there since early 60s, right? 
with the classical method. I don't know whether this motivated them or this theory motivated them, but I see a connection. Is that they're also doing the same. They're saying if I if I am producing more of and better offspring, that means I am in a good region. Let's explore it. So let's increase the mutation strength. That means increase the sigma. What does it mean? Increase the sigma means I will now create offspring that are a little bit away from the parent. So I want to go get quickly towards the optima now. Okay, very similar principle in this too. So this kind of principle can stay in you, stay with you and say if you are de defining any algorithm later on, these are good things to remember and, and have it in your algorithm. Decrease otherwise. So if you have five, uh, four or uh, sorry, three or less success out of 20, that means there are not many, not too often you are creating good. So you landed up in a space uh, where there is not many good solution around it, then you decrease the mutation strain. And that's exactly what they do, they contract, right? So this will happen when you reach near the optima and your current solution is very close to the optima and now anything you create around you most likely they are not good because you are almost close to the optima. So now you reduce your sigma, your strength, then what happens? Now you are focusing. So now you will be creating much closer points to your current point and maybe by that you can find a slightly better and this is how you can hill climb and get to the actual optima. So the important thing here is this number one fifth. Okay? So that came, I think, from the, exp the theor theoretical results is what they did. All right. So once they realized that once they, ha they have a population, they could do recombination. So they introduced two kinds of recombination. One is the intermediate recombination. The other is discrete. The intermediate was, I think one of you had suggested here, why don't we take an average, is basically the same thing. So they do a multi-parent recombination. So they have a population size, let's say 20, mu is 20, uh, but then they choose, let's say, rho. So rho is the size of the parents that you have to take for recombination. So rho could be 4 in this example. So you pick up 4 solutions from your population. This is one solution, 6 variables, another solution, 6 variables, and so on and so forth. Um, and then what you do is go variable by variable and find out, uh, choose one at random. So this is the intermediate. Uh, sorry, this is discrete. This is discrete. Uh, let me talk the discrete first. So you just pick one out of the four at random. So for example, I may pick this one, I may pick that one, and so on and so forth. Some combination of those. So then you created a new child. Okay, so that's a recombinant child. And now you are going to be applying that mutation, Gaussian mutation, on this. Is that clear? So that's called intermediate. It's more or less like the uniform crossover that we have. Now, in the intermediate, it's just the mean. So I'm going to take the mean of all these, and that will be here. Mean of all these, that will be here. So basically, you take four parents, you go to the centroid of those. That's your recombinant. And then you perturb that with a mutation. Is that clear? So that's the, uh, that's the recombination effect in evolution strategy. Hans-Georg Baer, Baer uh, has actually done a lot of work in this theory. And he actually has shown that the effect of recombination. So then they call, when you have recombination, they call mu slash rho comma lambda. That's the general uh, expression for telling that you have, a, you have a recombination. So mu slash rho comma lambda. So in this particular experiment, they have done rho is equal to mu. <coughs> so all parents are used for recombination. <coughs> and lambda is 50. So what they did is they fixed lambda equal to 50. That means 50 children are created. Mu is something they are changing. So when you have mu equal to 10, that means 10 populations, all 10 are used, and they are, I think, using here the intermediate. If I'm not mistaken, I've not written it here, but it's probably intermediate. So you take all 10 of them, take an average, okay, and then you mute it that 50 times, and you get 50 different children. And that is the algorithm you have. Uh, and it's a comma strategy, not a plus strategy. So if you don't have the recombination, the perf this is a performance index. Higher, the better. So you see that as you increase the mutation, uh, sorry, the population size, the performance drops because they have a fixed number of overall function evaluations. So if you use large population size, you are not allowing too many generations. Okay? But if you do with recombination, you see how the performance go up. And importantly, there exists an optimal population size. Okay. This is for a particular problem, 
but uh, when you change the problem, these optimal population size will be different. But this is what they call about genetic repair. When you do recombination, it seems to, because the, all these points are independently placed, right? When you do a averaging, <coughs> you are actually getting a collective idea about where the solutions are. <coughs> so this kind of takes away the variances that you have. So this is what they rename and call it as a genetic repair. So that you get a repair in this and you get a solution and one solution you are then mutating. So the algorithms behaves in a little reliable manner when you do the recombination. <coughs> okay, I'm not going to dwell too much onto this, but they then I mean it's a lot of years of research they have done on this, right? So when you have problems which look like this, uh, what what does this mean? Uh, the optimum is here. So these are contour plots. This is a function called Rosenbruch function. Sometimes it's also known as a banana function because this part looks like a banana. Um, these lines are equal fitness lines. Okay? Now you see that if you go away from this direction, it's like very steep hill, very steep. So it's like you know what we call is the Grand Canyon. So if you look at the Grand Canyon, um, if you go along the river, so there is a river that fl that flowing underneath, right? So if you f if you follow the river, you there is a slope. That's why the water is moving, right? But this one is saying that, okay, the water is moving this way. And here there is a well. That's the minima. So the water all goes there. Water coming from here and also going there. But it's a river, Grand Canyon. It just keep, keeps on flowing. But you have to stop your imagination there and say that the water stops at a certain point. That's where the minima is. Okay? But if you go out of the river orthogonally, you have a big hill to climb. Okay? So this is what they're saying, actually, that if you are going this way, there is a big hill to climb in either direction. But if you follow in this direction, you have a gentile drop in the function value. So if you are doing an optimization okay, algorithm, you are not like to go this direction because you know that the function value increases very high. Your search should be along these directions. So your algorithm should be able to identify that as you are running that which way my function value increases or decreases when I am minimizing. And CMAS does a pretty good job, right, in, in identifying. So CMAS, it will immediately find this is the direction to go. This is the principal direction to go. It will find this as one of the principal directions. Orthogonal to it is another principal direction, okay? Now, they were trying to achieve this. So CMAS came out much later. So these are correlated stuff in 70s they did. So what they did is they, they introduced, in addition to sigma, the correlation coefficients of all variables. So there are almost order n square correlation coefficients. Okay? And then they part out with the correlation. So now instead of having just, um, just a normal distribution axis wise, your normal distributions can be correlated. Okay? So like you see them uh, like this here, these kind of things. So your correlation says that if you go along these directions, you are going to have a much better increase or the drop in the function value. So this method, they are learning all the sigma and all the correlation coefficient, they call covariances, they are learning through the, through the operations of the algorithm. So this is a bit more complex, but it can solve this kind of problem nicely, co the correlated problems. Again, I'm just giving you a hand waving argument here for details you have to look into the literature. Let me skip this one, uh, also skip this one. Um, I just want to show you here is that they have the power to solve such functions which are dynamic. So what's happening in this plot is that uh, up to 500 iteration, we have one optima. Somewhere there is an optima. And this algorithm, this is the function value. And this is the standard deviation of the popular mutation strength. You can see that the function value is dropping. This is in log, log, semi log scale. So this is an exponential growth when you have a straight line. So exponentially, your best solution is approaching the minima. And by the time when it's 500 generation, you are almost 10 to the power minus 18 or so from the optima. So it's very, very close to the optima, almost converge. Okay? At this point, the optima has changed to some other point. So it's a dynamic problem that you're talking about. Now that solution where the function which was up to here in this range, whatever was the function, here is the optima and it's got there. But now this solution for the new problem is no good. Right? But the new optimum has moved somewhere. So the function value immediately goes up because it's a bad solution. 
it takes few generations, few iterations for it to learn where to go now to find the new optima. Once it finds the new region, then it again exponentially converges. Again the optima has changed, takes a few iterations to get there and then again converges, right. So, this can continue forever if you are changing these things. Only thing is you have to give it a bit of time here, okay. Uh, some time for it to learn where to go. And the mutation strength also you see the sigma varies so nicely. When it, so, when it, when it is a bad situation now, now first thing it does, it increases the mutation strength automatically, okay. It goes to a mutation strength very high, that means you have gone out of it, you are creating now points which are far away from the parents, then you have identified where the new place is, then you can converge, okay. So, this has been one of their nice results uh, till 70s and early 80s, okay, that their algorithms is self adaptive. It can, if, if you, okay, your, if your problem is changed, give me a little bit of time, although I have converged over there, I can go out from it and get to the new optima. Usually, I have a simulation, but I, I have to locate where my computer they are. So, I was visiting them uh, around 98, 99, around 97, 99, around that time for a year. Um, and I learned all these the evolution strategy, all these different results, nice results that they have. And by that time, I just developed SPX. And I showed you that even, even if we concentrate our initial population, between 0 0.9999 to 1. So, that means if I show you all 50 solutions, they will be all look like a blip, all like on one point. There is no diversity, but SBX can go out and increase its diversity driven by the fitness function. We do not need an external sigma or anything. Based from the fin function information, it can go out and converge, right. I showed you that. Just takes a little bit of more iterations because it has to figure out where to go. This is the simulation on the same problem with SBX no parameter nothing, okay. You can see very similar behavior happening. It takes a little bit of time, but then it finds it again, okay. So, then in that paper I showed, I kind of argued by taking the internal formulas again algorithmic equivalence that I have been talking about. Uh, I realized since then that both SBX with the GA and the evolution strategy with the correlated stuff that they are doing in principle at the core they have very similar governing equations and I could show it that they are very similar. I could correlate it and that is why you get very similar results. So, they are two different names, two different ways of getting there, but at the core they are very similar, okay. So, I think instead of um, suggesting just another algorithm, sometimes you should try to look into the core of it and compare with some well established methods to see am I doing anything different really. But because at the periphery of it, at the surface of it, it may look like different with different names, different ways of doing it, but at the core they may be all the same, okay. Uh, I am going to leave the meta modeling for now. I just want to quickly go to, I will come back to this, maybe at the very last day or whenever we have time. Uh, now I am going to move to, um, so I have left something here, but we will come back as I said. Now I go to the L 7. Okay, lecture 7, move to lecture 7. Okay, so we are go I am going to show you this large scale application that I have been talking you about and where the need of customization is very important and then move to multimodal optimization after that, okay. So, let me first introduce you the problem. It turns out that the algorithm we came up with is not only good for this problem, but many other problems as well. They all come under one class of problems. But let me explain the problem first. So, here is, it is in a foundry we are doing all this. So, you melt some amount of metal. Uh, this is a small vessel I am showing you here, but the company I worked with from Lucknow had a 650 kilo vessel. So, you cannot just do it by yourself. You need a machine to tilt it and all that. So, they have two vessels. One is 650 kilos the other is 500 kilos. So, 650 kilos they melt 10 times a day because to melt the iron it takes time, right? 10 times a day. So, you have total 6500 kilos of molten metal on one of the days that you are using 650 kilo. When they use the 500 kilo they melt 13 times, they could do 13. So, basically it is the same amount of metal 6500 kilos every day, okay. Now, they have gone much bigger. I mean I just made the 
the CEO of their company. So they've gone much bigger now. Um, but that time they were just doing that. Okay. Now once you melt the first, so every time you are melting, it's called a heat. So one hit is either 650 kilos of molten metal or 500 kilos of molten metal. Once you have done that, now you are going to pour them to make some castings, right? Any of you have worked in a foundry or not? Some lab, yeah. So, so you know that there is a sand casting and you put, put the molten metal. Now every casting has different weights, okay? Uh, maybe let us say minimum one is 30 kilo, then could be 35, 70, 50, all these. So you know each of them here. And some of them has to be done 10 copies, another maybe 5 copies and so on and so forth. So you have made let us say 5 or 6 or 10 of them and you have utilized 640 kilos. Now 10 kilos are left in your vessel, but none of them is 10 kilos. So that is a waste because you cannot say, okay, let me pour 10 kilos here and after 1 hour I will come back with the second heat and pour the rest, right? Either you do completely or you do not do it, it is a waste. So that point you think, ah, I could have taken a different combination. I could have utilized 645 kilos. So only 5 kilos would have been a waste. So the whole goal, so this person was attending one of such courses that I used to do in Kanpur. Uh, he attended the lecture, one of the lectures and said, you can solve my problem maybe. And he said he was using an Excel based um, procedure. After dinner, he would fire it for a problem which is about 30,000 variables that are needed. It is a huge problem. Next day morning during breakfast he will see the results and it has about 70 to 75 percent of metal utilization. And he looks at the solution and he sees by hand he can change few things to improve. So obviously the Excel based code that he was using was not that efficient to take it to his expectation was more than 90 percent metal utilization he could do. So he came and said we need an algorithm. We cannot just do it manually because of the sheer number of variables that we have, okay? Because he wants to do it for a month or two month long schedule today. Because he is a person who goes around, gets orders, new orders and he gives instructions of how to do it. Uh, what is the sequence of every heat, which other things needs to be done, okay? So here the problem is that we want to maximize the metal utilization. So every time you heat, you see can you maximize it completely. So what, was, what would be a maximum optimal value, function value that you will get? What is the maximum utilization that you can get? Yeah, so 100 percent, 100 percent utilization. So you melt at 650, you have utilized all 650. You melt at 500, you utilize at 500, but it may not be possible because you do not know how the combinations are, right? You may be still left with 2, 3 kilos every time. So, but somewhere close to 100 percent is your optimum, may not be exactly 100 percent. But he is getting 70, 75 percent, so long way to go till the optima. He wants a target. He told me a target. If you can give me a 90 percent, it is a good solution, okay? So sometimes we do with targets. We do not find the optimum, but we find a target, okay? Because the company is happy with that, right? Okay. So, what I do is, so when you get a problem like this from industry because somebody was asking can you go through a process of how to solve a problem, a practical problem. So I am just slowly going through that process. So this fellow was sitting in my class at the end of the course. He asked me for some time that he wants to discuss. So we discussed and then he told me the problem. So I understood the problem. Then after he went back, I had to formulate the problem, right? Formulation is a big deal, right? So here is the formulation. So x, i, j are the variables here. What is i and j index? i is the index for heats. So the first heat is i equal to 1, second is i equal to 2 and so on and so forth. There are total h heats let us say I have and h could go to uh, 1000, 2000, something like that or even more. Um, w, i is for the ith heat. That means the first hit, is it 650 kilos or is it 500 kilos? So if you tell me you are working in a company where every hit has a different thing, I have the way to do it. So my formulation takes care of it. But in our case, first 10 WIs are exactly 650. Second 13 WIs are 500, right? Like that. But you can put it anything here. Okay. So this is the capacity of the vessel. WJ 
is the weight of the jth casting. J is the index for casting order. So, let us say I have got 500 casting to be made in 2 months. I have given them a number id 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and I know that this first casting I have to make 10 copies and that is my r j. r 1 will be 10. Next one I have to make 20 copies. So, r 2 will be 20 like that. This is known to me because I do not want to make one extra or one less. I want to make as many as I have to deliver because otherwise it is a waste right uh, or not able to satisfy the, the, the demand. So, w j is as the weights of these casting. x i j actually says how many copies of the jth casting you want to make from the ith heat. So, x i j becomes like a matrix to me. So, here you have the i index area of the j index this is the number of castings. So, in this particular example, I am showing you that there are 10 castings. Each of them, the demand is 7, 7, 6 like this and this is the heat. I am again showing you with an example with 10 hits. First hit, the solution says make one copy of the second casting, one copy of the third casting, two copies of the seventh casting and one copy of eighth casting. That is it. When you do that, you will be utilizing 623 kilos and it is a 650 kilo vessel that day. So, your utilization is 95.85 percent this by this. Okay. The whole thing is your solution vector. Now, instead of a vector, we have a matrix that is the only difference. Second heat, you make two castings, two copies of the first casting, one copy of fifth and two copies of nine and you will be utilizing 615 and you have a utilization of 94.62 like that. Every casting now, once you have these x i j values, the weights are known for each of these castings. You can compute this and you compute this as well and eventually take an average of all that and you get 95.05 percent. So, this is the average utilization, metal utilization you have when you have completed all 10 heats. Is that clear? So, that is what this is saying. Weighted sum of all the x i j s. It is a linear function of x i j, right? Okay. All these are constant. This is linear function. There is no x i j square or anything. One of the constraint is that this weight here, which is the W j times x i j, the total metal that you need to satisfy all these things has to be less than 650, because you cannot take 655 kilo, right. But the, the, the algorithm does not know it. So, you have to put it as a constraint, right. So, we put this constraint, this has to be less than equal to W i and this has to be true for all the heats. So, if you have 1000 heats, there are 1000 such constraints. Again, is it a linear or non-linear constraints? Linear constraints. The other kinds of constraints are equality. So, this is inequality linear, linear constraints. This is an equality linear constraints, which says sum of all of them. So, 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2. That means, how many copies out of 10 hits you have made of casting 1? That has to be exactly equal to the demand. You do not want to make one more or one less. So, that is why there is equality sign. Okay? And again, if there are uh, n total castings, there will be n such constraints and this n could be again in the order of 500,000 something like that. Okay. So, this is the problem. So, linear objective function, linear constraints, inequality, equality both are present here. So, what is the difficulty? I could use a simplex search. Only problem is all x i j s has to be an in integer. Why? What are the x i j s? How many copies of the of the jth casting I'm making from i th heat? I told you it cannot be 2.5. You cannot do two casting, <coughs> two copies of the casting, and then one half. You can you cannot do either. You do two or three. So I realize, oh, this one up to here it was fine, but everything has to be an integer. Every variable has to be an integer. Of course, non-negative. Okay, that makes everything different now. Okay. So, we use, so it is called integer linear program. Total number of variables is n times h, because it is a matrix and constraints are n here and h there, n plus h constraints. So, these numbers are such that n times h according to the company can go to 20,000 to 50,000 over different months, different years, it can be different. So, it can be 20,000 to 50,000. So, it could be huge. Okay. So, then I looked at this problem and I realize it is a knapsack problem. So, as I said, this problem is similar to many other problem. A knapsack problem is what? That you have a bag or a sack where you can take some valuables and put inside, but the sack has a weight limit. 
If you put more than that, it is going to break. So, you cannot take it. So, now you want to maximize your um, value of the bag because every one of them has different value. So, this is very similar of a problem. Another problem is called cutting stock problem, where you have let us say these, um, uh, these timbers or railway lines, all these things that they make, they come in a standard size. So, each of them may be let us say 20 feet long or 50 feet long. And you have to use this and cut and put it and make a house, right? So, you have to cut it in different sizes, okay? And when you cut this two, three pieces, something is left and that may be useless. So, if you then, and if you have to do it many, many times, you realize that, oh, if I had done it some other combination, maybe I could have utilized it in a, my, my unused part would have been very, very less. So, again, you want to maximize the use part. Very similar problem, right? So, you see that there are lots of problems that come in practice, which is this type, and I call this a resource allocation problem. You have a resource, how do you allocate it for, for different ways? It can go into for a war situations where you have lots of tanks and and armies and now you want to utilize, you send them in various places. You do not want to send in a way so that every one of, the, so one particular one is weak or you have only few left for a very important mission. So, whenever you have allocation that you have to do, you can get into this okay, scheduling problem, but you will eventually get into this um, discrete variable scenario. And then all you have is a branch and bound that we talked about and we also talked about that those are exponential algorithm. Okay. So, uh, I am just going to now not talk in that much detail here, but let me show you with this and I'll then I am going to give you a break and come back and show you what we have done for it. So, just to test again, again this is another thing as I said any industry problem you have, um, you need to first use a standard classical method. That is because those methods are much older, people have are using them for a long time. If you can show them no, that popular method is no more giving me results, then there is a case for you to go to do develop on your own something, right. So, I took a scenario where there are 10 castings and weight of each casting is going like this 175 is first one is very heavy, second one 145, 65. So, it is a wide range, even 20 also, some ones, right. And these are the number of copies that I need for each of them. Okay? So, if I see 20 copies with 175 kilo each, I need so much material. So, I figured out we need total 20,000 kilos. And I have used here, I think, 650 kilo vessel. So, you can back calculate and see how many heats you need. So, divide this by 650. It turns out, yeah, 650 kilos. It turns out that if you even assume that you will be utilizing 99.7 percent uh, of metal every time you heat it, you require 31 hits. Because if you do 30 hits, you will not be able to uh, not be able to get that much material okay, to have this. So, the total number of variables 31 times 10, 310. It is not, it is a modest number, 310 variables for a linear program is not big, but integer linear program it is a it is a sizable number. Okay? All right. So, I sh I'm showing you results here with GLPK, which is a MATLAB version is available free. It's called Octave. It's very similar to Ma MATLAB. Some of you may have used it. It has a code called GLPK. So, first I wanted to, before I bought anything, I thought let me see if, if internet, if there's anything we can use. So, GLPK is available. We could have used MATLAB's Intel in Prog as well, but we have used that. And um, this problem, 310 variable over here, I could not get a result. When we run it, we did not get a result. Um, then I realized 310, 31 hits is the minimum number of hits needed to get a solution. Okay? But your optimization algorithm should be pretty smart to get you a solution with just that minimum number of hits. So, what is the, what's the number? If you do 31 times 650, how much is that? Can someone compute it? 31 times 650? So, it is not enough, right? It is less than 20,000, right? So, no, 31 should be more than 20,000. 30 should, 30 should be what? 30 times 650. Uh, we can calculate that. 30 times, huh? that is one end. But if you do one more hit, it just crosses, just crosses 20,000. So, it is just enough. But you see, you got 
out of all the metal, you just enough. So you need to have your algorithm really good to give you a very efficient solution to utilize only 30 minutes. So I thought it's too much for the algorithm, maybe. So we said, OK, let's take one more heat. So another 650 kilos you can take, which is more one heat more. But let's see, now I made the problem a little simpler. But this is such a problem that when I increase the heat by one more, I actually increase my number of variables. So 31, 32 times 10 would be 320. So I've increased 10 variables, and I made the problem easier. That's very unusual. In optimization, when you increase the number of variables, it gets harder. But here, it's a resource allocation. By increasing the variables, I'm saying I give you a lot more flexibility now to get a solution. And look what happens. It gets it in 1.24 seconds on an average time. And I did, I think, 10 different runs. And these were 0.22 seconds of standard deviation in time. So pretty consistent results. And this is the total number of evaluations needed to get to that solution with 96.15%. So when you add one more, your efficiency goes down. Average efficiency goes down because you're utilizing more. more you need more metal to, to utilize only 20,000. OK, but that's the optimal results. I can prove it. That's the optimal result. Okay. Then I said, OK, let's, the later on we, bought, we got Ciplex. So then we said, oh, yeah, 0 0.03 seconds. It's even much faster, right, to solve the same problem. Only 184 solutions. Pretty smart algorithm. And same efficiency, same final solution it got. Okay. Then I said, can it do the 310? It turns out, yes, Ciplex is much smarter than GLPK. It can solve. It takes little more time, you see, 0 0.02 seconds more on an average. No standard deviation, because anytime you run, these are so good methods that every time you get the same result when it works. 249, little more, but you get much, much better efficiency. That's because you have less metal you have melted, and you have the most efficient results. So this is the best optimal solution for this problem. If you keep on relaxing, adding more and more heat, your efficiency will go down, but the algorithm will have easier time getting it. Okay? So we already see that when there are about 300 variable, and you're looking for the optimum, some algorithms are not so efficient, although they use this branch and bound. Both of them use the same algorithm. But the implementation of Ciplex is much smarter, more efficient, so it does it in a quick way. Then I say, OK, let's go an order of magnitude more. So we go for 1,000 variables. So we have increased everything now. Number of copies we have increased so that we need more, so that we need to have 1,000 variables now. Ciplex can still do that, 0.13 seconds, more than that, because it's a much bigger problem, 947, 99.462. That's the optimum again. Then I said, let's go to 2,000. And we have an issue. It cannot solve it. And I showed you some results early on with 1,800. It could solve up to 1,800, but not more than that. OK. This is where I'm showing that this is an optimum for the 1,000 variable case. OK. And this picture I've showed you before, but I'm showing you again. Here is that for the 2,000 variable problem, we have been tracking of why Ciplex couldn't do it. Um, this is with time after 30 uh, minutes, so 1,800 seconds we are seeing that the number of branches that it has gone to is of the order of 37 million, this blue line. And these are the number of open nodes still at that point, which is scaled over here. That's about 30, 33, 34,000 nodes are still open. So you think that it is going to come down and solve the problem. But if you keep running, we actually run it up to 15 hours. And this goes on increasing. Both of them keep on increasing. So it's, it's, it's never solved. It. So that's where we are uh, with, the, with this method. So this makes a case that, yeah, we need to look at something else to solve this problem. Because we're stuck at 2,000 range, but we have to go to 20,000, an order of magnitude more, to 50,000. right? So I take a break, and we come back, uh, and I'll show you the algorithm we have designed. Okay. I have, I have chosen. I have, I have framed the problem now that I need 20 copies of 
this casting and 20 copies of that casting. Uh, okay, no problem. Hmm. One at random for the intermediate, it's a mean. So, intermediate is mean. If the parents in that parent, yeah, they do not have a best solution, right? Right, but when we take the mean in all the cases, if we found the same uh, kind of uh, bad solution in that particular string, could be, could be. Uh, so, so you can include one of the parent can be your best all the time, you can include, but they do not do that, they just randomly pick four solutions or row solutions, row is that number of uh, number of parents and then they take the mean. But there is a chance to after that to happen. Uh, yeah, it can happen, but then sometimes we welcome it because that means that is a region we are going now and see if there is anything there, right. You cannot always do around best and best and best because then you then you can be the best can be, so then you can solve the unimodal problem very well because there is only one best eventually, but if there are multiple best like multimodal problems, then your current best may not be looking at the global best of the of the landscape. So, sometimes going around and looking at currently not so good solutions can lead you to a better optima. So, sometimes we welcome these that things. Is more than a, more of a in yeah, yeah, when you have multimodality and you see most of these practical problems are multimodal. So, hardly few you can get unimodal problems. There are four, four optima, local optima, four local optima four for that. Optima and two uh, no, 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 all four are global, all four are global. I have described that in my book, you can see towards the end, there are all four that are global having a function value 0, all four of them because there are four roots to those individual terms. Uh, but then sometimes we and, and fortunately for that problem every quadrant has an optima. So, I am always showing you on the first quadrant 0 to 5, 0 to 5. So, there is only one minima. So, it is a unimodal problem if you restrict your search in the first quadrant. If, we are doing it in different, uh, different if you take the all quadrants then there are four optima. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, always good because you know where where you're supposed to go, and if you are not going there for some reason, you have to still modify your algorithm. But if you're solving a random problem or a problem from practice to develop your algorithm, you don't know where to go, so you don't know whether you are doing good or bad. So that's why you always test first. Do testing on test problems. Yeah. The schema actually you have mentioned regarding the schema. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So schema is something that how many best copies you can generate from the schema. No, 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 no. Schema is not that complex. Schema is it represents a number of similar strings. So when I say one and all star, it represents all the strings that have one at the first place. That's all it says. For that purpose only we use schema. Yeah. And now basically a schema represents a number of solutions together. It's a collection of solutions, it's a set of solutions. And when we do the schema processing, schema growth, and we are saying, is it growing? We are actually saying, if I take now the whole region here, and how many copies are in here now, that is MHT, next generation MHT plus 1, has it increased? Have I got more copies here now coming in or less copies? So, if it is more and more copies are coming, that means that is a good region. Maybe uh, the optima is somewhere there. And then I am observing, is my GA able to put more and more copies there? So, in order to so know that how many uh, best copies are being uh, generated over in that region, schema is used. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, schema represents a set of solutions, not just one solution. So, either this condition has to be uh, checked, also has to be checked? No, nobody checks these things. Uh, these are more for pedagogical purposes. Just when you developed an algorithm, you can also print out how the schema number of copies for each schema is increasing. because if there is a test problem, you know where the optima is. You can immediately think of a schema that will occupy the optima, optimal region. You can write down the schema. Now, you go to your code and say, if you are doing binary coded GA, as long as you have any point that represents a schema, you count it and every generation you print it, how is that number 
And if it is dropping with your algorithm with some parameters, you say, no, no, I have not got that right. Then you come with another parameter, see whether it is growing or not. So, you should come up with settings of the parameters when it starts to grow. So, these are for developmental purposes of an algorithm or pedagogical purposes, these are, these are never used in practice, because in practice you do not know where the optimum is. So, you do not know what is your best schema, right. So, these are all for understanding purposes or in the development of an algorithm purposes. Yeah, I took the same function to show and run over all the algorithms, so that you also see a comparative evaluation on the same problem, how different algorithms behave. Some takes a longer route, some takes a straightforward route. So, this gives you a mental picture of how every algorithm performs on this particular problem. That does not mean another problem will perform the same way. So, I have seen textbooks where they for this algorithm they use one, another algorithm they use another function, another algorithm another function. I do not know what is the purpose. So, if you keep the problem same and show the results of different algorithm on the same problem, you also get a comparative evaluation. But the flip side is people may think these alg algorithms are only good for that problem, <laughs> because I only use that. But do not think it that way. It is just that I used it to, uh, to have a comparative evaluation as well. Okay. कलकेल Real code it. Real parameter G. It is calke holo. It is exercise problem calke hoyega. So it is calke ta hoyega. So it is achkir to. It is. It is akonet ta. Akonet ta. Ha. 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 তাহলে এটা কি ছিল এটা কি ছিল এটা আমি তো মনে হচ্ছে এটা স্যার ওই কোথায় আছে না মানে আপনি এটা লিখে দিয়েছেন এটা এটা কি ওখানে গন্ডগোল হচ্ছে আমি জানি না আমাকে লিখতে বলেছে এখানে সো আই ডোন্ট নো এই নাম্বার কি করছেন আপনি লিখেছেন ওটা আমি না না আমি আসলে না এটা তাহলে দিলীপের হবে এটা তাহলে দিলীপের হবে তাহলে এই দুটো মুভ হবে আপনার এইখানে আর এইখানে এটা আসবে এখানে এটা যাবে এখানে এটা আসবে এখানে এন্ড এইটা যাবে এইখানে ঠিক আছে এখন এটা আর এখানে আপনি দিলীপের থেকে নেবেন এই দুটো এইটা এখন আজকে সকালে তো এটা হলো লার্জ স্কেল অপটিমাইজেশন এটা কি কন্টিনিউ হবে হ্যাঁ ঠিক আছে এটা লিখে নাও আবার বিকেল একটা বিকেলে লিখে দেব সেটা একটা একটা করে করুন এটাই বেস্ট বলুন ইউ ক্যান দেন ডেভেলপ ওয়ান অ্যালগরিদম ফর দ্যাট ক্লাস ইয়া Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which names so that I can go to For the customization, uh, first thing you should cite is the those two NFL papers. Okay, that is from 1997, um, IEEE TEC, Transactions and Evolutionary Computation, 97. IEEE, no freelance theorem. If you type, you will get there. So, those two papers you should cite because that's the first time they said one algorithm is not good for all problems. Okay, so then comes the customization. There you can cite many of our papers. If you go to our website, um, this casting scheduling, if you search with the casting scheduling, you will find the paper. Um, any application papers that we have, we talk about the need for customization. But that is like you only have one problem they will tell us, right? Yeah. So is there any review paper which can tell that? No, there is no review paper on different ways of doing I have not seen that at least. Which is categorize the all the class of that No, no, the, that is something important for someone to do, but uh, nobody has done that. And it is a hard job, I think. There may be some little caveats here and there, so one has to be really 
clear on those things. So, um, I have not seen yet, but there is definitely a need for such a review paper. Yeah, yeah. Now it's just there, here, and there. So, any application paper you see, there will be some customization. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but um, that kind of very straightforward classification that this is your problem and it falls in this category, so this algorithm is great. No, nothing like that exists. Yeah, no, I cannot, I cannot give you one algorithm for the problem you are asking or you want to solve. Uh, there is no such review paper, there is no such way, it is still a bit of searching that you have to do with similar problems, reading you have to do. Maybe this problem I am talking about fits well with some of your problems and then you, then you know that this algorithm, yeah. Okay, so it's a combined problem. No, there may not be anything yet that some men, somebody has may not have done uh, a very efficient algorithm for that yet. So that makes a case for you to do it for the first time. But all these I'm talking about here, it stays in your mind. And then what are the do's and don'ts? Try to get that from this course. Okay, you can't expect each one of you is from different fields that. I am going to give you an example from your field. It is not possible, but you should see the main theme behind all these that I am saying. I am stressing that as I am going. And then you have to do a little bit of research, search on finding out what is out there and keeping some of these principles in mind. You should be able to develop something on your own. Yeah. Okay. It's a permutation problem or what? Sir, simple shape, I, 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 I need to know what is what about the two numbers. Oh, you just randomly pick two and decide the better one. Out of this 15 con combination, I randomly pick six Okay, yeah. So, from six, six choose two. Yeah, six yeah. choose two way yeah. of doing so it. So, out of 15, I pick randomly six. Mm -hmm. I calculate the fitness value. Mm -hmm. Then that uh, six goes to that crossover. Mm -hmm. Again, in crossover, 15 combinations are possible. Yeah. Uh, after this 15 combination, uh, a 80 percentage is for crossover, 20 percent is Just pass crossover. through. But we do not do all combinations, like all 15 combinations. We just do three pairs, three pairs of s comparisons. Actually, six pairs eventually we will do, because we need every pair will give me one solution. So, out of the 15, we are picking six only. That is random. Randomly, we are picking those in six. In Here also, also, crossover also six, six, six pairs. Randomly. Yeah, actually three pairs, crossover it's half. Yeah. Three pairs three we are pairs choosing randomly. randomly. Yeah, not everything is checked. Then it will be too many solutions you have, you have to evaluate. Oh yes, uh, so I have sent you already. Okay, and you now, okay, I will do that. Okay, can you call everybody? We need to start. Is everybody in? I think some people are missing, but anyway. Um, so, I need to make an announcement because I keep on forgetting. Um, I told you yesterday we are going to give you the send you the codes. So, if you want the codes, please send an email to what is what uh, to Saikat and uh, the other person I forget his name. Uh, Rao. So, get their email address and send them an email. So, they have your email address and then they will send you by email. Okay? 
and we have to do it today because tomorrow there is a lab session we have in the afternoon and so we will just go there and you can then download these codes in MATLAB and try to run it. It's the same problems that I showed you, you try to solve them and because that is an assignment you have to then submit it. So try to solve it and then we will come back for the exam. So tomorrow we will have the last exam. So you already have three right and then the last one will be tomorrow. Uh, so that is the plan. So you have to give your email address to them. Okay. So try to do it before you go for lunch. Uh, either so how would they give you by email or on a piece of paper or email would be better so they have no error in reading from the paper. Okay, so send send them an email. Okay, so um, let's continue with this uh, problem. So we saw that there is a case where we need a we need an algorithm that can handle large number of variables and I told you that in such cases you need to customize that is that is the way to solve these problems because we tried using the basic vanilla GA that I talked to you about I call it vanilla GA because it's just a simple there is no flavor to it okay it's just the simple stuff uh, then to s that's almost useless to solve uh, any complex problems from practice and here the complexity comes from integer restrictions and large number of variables right. So we are customizing it now and there is no one way to customize the algorithm and you need to use the problem information to customize. But we do customization in every step here because it is a very large scale problem that we have to solve. So we even customize the initialization okay. We make sure so the way we customize is we have equality constraint remember there are many equality constraints sum of all x i j over j should be equal to r j over i should be equal to rj. So and remember if it is a equality constraint that is linear over no even even then you are saying no why why because I want to understand how are you thinking why is it not a blockwise crossover what do you mean by blockwise crossover okay. So let me put it here so I have got block 1 block 2 block 3 block 4 for parent 1 and I am going to do another color here with parent 2 okay. Now what have I done in that process I have taken my child here is created like this I have taken from the second one first first block is taken from the second second block is taken from the second and third one is taken from the second fourth one and fifth one third one is taken from the first block first parent is it not. So this is what I have got as a child why are you saying it is not a crossover you why, what is the confusion let me see or you want to say now it is crossover or you still say it is not ok why that is why I want to understand if this were 0 0 let us say 0 1 1 0 and this is 1 1 0 1. So I let me put it here 0 1 1 0 1 1 0 1 and I do a crossover. So one thing is I do a one point crossover but this is not a one point crossover this is a uniform crossover where I go bit by bit and take one. So I have taken first one from first second one from second third one from the second I am sorry first one from first second one from first third one from second and fourth one from first again it is a uniform crossover exactly uniform crossover except that within the block I am not doing any crossover the whole block is copied. So it is a very higher level crossover we are having it is a uniform crossover right and things from two parents are taken things from two parents oops, this does not show up sometimes yeah the things from two parents so you see that this color actually shows something this one came from first and these three came from second that is precisely the idea of crossover no other method can give you that okay this kind of operations not bit here here block wise so this whole block is copied this whole block here is copied you see that whole block is copied this whole block again from the second parent is copied here 
from the first parent, this whole block is copied here, right? So if you call each block a number a, b, c, d, and some other g, h, i, j, whatever, and then you are just copying from the two parents like you do in a uniform crossover. Now, except in uniform crossover, we do it with probability 0.5. It can come from either one of them with probability 0.5. We are saying, no, we're not going to do it with probability. What you're going to do is now look at, because each one of these, each one of these bits now, I can say whether 0 is better or 1 is better. Whichever is better, I'm keeping here. It's not random. That's the only difference I'm doing. Because I have to customize, because it's a linear problem, so I can be greedy. Because there's only one optima in a linear problem. In a quadratic problem, also, there is one optima quadratic programming and linear programming. There's one optima. So since there's one optima, anything that gives me a better value, I should cling to it. I should actually go further. So this is really, I'm very greedy here. So even in the crossover, I'm not doing it 0.5. I'm saying which one is better, I keep it in my child. And from two parents, I'm creating one child. OK, I'm not creating two child as, you, as usually we do. Because again, I want to be greedy. I want to just not unnecessarily create another child. OK, I have to be very, very careful. OK, now in that process, you see, I have still have an invisible solution. And now these equality constraints are all satisfied. OK, this is supposed to be 3, 2, and 2. And you see, I have matching here. But this one that I've got, I've screwed up now. It's not matching. Um, it's supposed to be 2, but I've got a 3 here. It's supposed to be here, it's supposed to be 2 again, but I've got uh, 3 here. So all these that are in red, actually, or orange, is actually violating, violating the equality constraints. And these ones violating inequality constraints. So I made the solution a bit worse in terms of constraint violation. But at least these numbers are now pretty close to 650. Okay, And I'm relying on my mutation operator. Now I go to mutation 1. Sometimes it does during the day. So we'll, uh, yeah, now I should be able to move. Yeah. So this is custom mutation operator number one. Again, I'm not going into the details of all that. Uh, the paper is yet to be out, uh, but um, I'm just showing you here what is um, how, how it works in words. So this was my solution to start with. This was my child, which was invisible. In this operator, I'm trying to fix the equality constraints. It's a very simple thing I could do, right? I look at only those that are violated. There are three, but it's supposed to be two. So all I have to do is take one out. So which one shall I take out? I look at which one of the three here, where there is one, non-zero, has got a violation, or is away from 650. So larger than 650. So I take one out from there. Okay. So then I go to the next one and next one, and I just follow this procedure, and I can fix it. So it's a mutation, again, not random perturbation. But it's a very careful perturbation by looking at my target what I'm doing. So you've got to do something sometime like that as customization. But it's still a mutation. I'm still following the evolutionary principle. The whole goal of mutation is to perturb a solution. The whole goal of crossover is to combine two things, good things of two parents into one. In a standard J, we don't look at which is the good part. But when I'm solving a big problem, I need to look at. Otherwise, otherwise it will take a lot of time to solve a billion variable problem. Okay, but the essence of evolutionary computing is still here. Mutation 2, after I've got that, I still see that this one is violated, so I need to fix this. How shall I fix it? Okay, now it is more than 650, right? It's just 4 kilos more. Still, it's an invisible solution. So I look at the solution here, okay? And now what I have to do, so all these are satisfied, and I don't want to violate this now. So now what I have to do, I have to kind of adjust that. Um, if this one I have, by keeping it 3, uh, what can I change so that this will go down, OK? And this will also not be uh, violated. So I can put this one over here. If this is 558, if I put the one over there, 558, is it going over 650 if I do? Right? If it is, then I cannot do this. Now let's go to another one here. So I have one here. If I put it here here or there, okay. this one, if it goes here, there, and there, still it will be 4. But now I'm taking one out from it, so this may go down 650. But can I take it there or here? 
So, there is this calculations we do and figure out where to move it okay, and without violating this. So, mutation to ensures that equality constraints are satisfied and it tries to satisfy the, this, but it could be that because there are finite options, I do not find any place to move it. Some other major changes are needed in order to have that, then I just leave it. I say okay, I could not solve it. So, there are 4 kilo is penalty. So, that penalty that goes as 4 kilo multiplied by 1000. So, I get 4000 gets subtracted from whatever is its uh, metal utilization. So, it is a negative infeasible, it is a negative fitness value which means it is infeasible. And then next time when you come with the tournament selection, this will be thrown out because if it compare with the feasible one, this will die. So, I tried little bit to fix it, I could not and I wait on the algorithm to trim it. Okay. If all my population members are infeasible, then this one has a lower violation, only 4 kilo violation, others are 40 kilo, 30 kilo violation, this one is still important, this one will still say, but eventually it will get, it will become feasible. Right? So, you see every operator here uses little bit of determinism, little bit of problem information, but the concept of the evolutionary computation is still there, it is a population based method. I could not have done this without the population, because crossover needs at least two population members. right? and two would not be enough because then you do not have any diversity, we need at least some population members. Okay. So, let me now go back to that small size problem that we did. I showed you the result for GLPK, PLX and there was a cover on it. I did not want to show the results then, but now I want to show you the result. 320, well little 0 0.01 seconds better with simplex, but look at the function evaluation, same accuracy, right? 310. Again, another second 0 0.101 second better, but look at the function evolution, almost half, okay, and the same accuracy. Now, 1,000 variables we do in 0 0.05 seconds compared to 0 0.13 seconds of simplex, same accuracy, smaller number of evaluations. Now I could solve 2,000 variable, okay, only 0.19 seconds, and with with optimal accuracy, okay. So up to this point now our algorithm is able to solve with very few evaluations and with a smaller time than the simplex method. Okay, now, I am going to show you some of the parametric study that we have done and taken it all the way to a very large size problem. This slide I am showing, if you had done random solution, if I have not used any algorithm, because sometimes on a problem like this, I have also showed you on the solar, solar uh, power problem that we create some random solutions to see where we are and we are far away from the optima. So, I have created um, how many 10,000 random solutions for a large problem. This is this one will have so many kgs of casting needed. So, I think this goes to a million variable, it is a huge problem. So, we need the whole problem now I have I have required so much demand and so many castings that you need to melt so many kgs which that goes to a million variable requirement of the problem all integers. I have pick 10,000 solutions at random. Okay. Uh, the best solution has a negative 7 million fitness, that means anything negative means is infeasible, I did not find a feasible solution. The worst one is minus 7.38 million, so they are all far away from being feasible, if you randomly pick solutions to this large scale problem. Then I thought okay, let me only use mutation 1 and mutation 2 to fix each of them, every one of them applying 1 and then 2 mutation. Well, it has come down, it has tried to make it feasible. So, all equality are made feasible now, inequality are still there and I have still minus 1.39 million, it is still far away from feasible solution. So, what I am showing for this slide is, this is such a bigger problem, if you are thinking of a random method, you are nowhere, you will not be able to do, maybe you need lots of lots of solutions there to accidentally heat up on one. Okay. <coughs> Second information I am going to give you is that there is a critical population size that is needed. That is typical in any kind of applications. So, what we do for that case, we fix the number of function evaluations okay, and then change the population size. So, we started with a population of size, I think this is 6, then we go to 12 and then I think we are going to 20 and then we have 28, then 34 I think and then 40 and so on and so forth. Okay. This is a very typical performance that when you have a very small population size, 
this is the fitness value. See, they are still negative means they did not find the feasible solutions. It could not solve the problem again with our algorithm. There are simply with six population size to solve a million variable problem, there is simply not enough diversity in the population for the algorithm to go past and get to the feasible. Okay? When you increase it to even 12, it has improved a little bit, but still not enough. These bars are uh, variations over 10 runs. Okay? Then this is the median run that I am showing. Then when you go to 20, then it's got very close to being feasible, very close to being the optimum, but still not there. But when we get to the size of 28, I have some runs that's giving me the result. But look at the variation. This one is here, the other one I cannot even show it here. So there's a big fluctuation. That means sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. When you run 10, to 10 different times, maybe one time it works or two times it works out of 10 times. So that's not a reliable method. So we go to 34 now here, 34. And now look at the standard deviation. It's not there. You cannot even see. All these standard deviation you cannot even see. So every time you run, you get the optimum, which is 0.997 metal, 99.7 percent metal leaf laziness. So that says the critical population size is around 34. When you are that, that range, anything below, you have a suboptimal performance. It does not just get stuck somewhere. But you have the right kind of size, right sample size with 1 million variables to have enough information so that this algorithm that we came up with can start from there and go. So if you go with my population sizing suggestion, which I gave two, two classes before, what did I say? n should be in proportion to number of variables. So it's a 1 million variable. You needed at least a million population size. But I'm showing you here 34. How? Am I contradicting myself? No, I'm not contradicting myself. When I said n is proportional to the number of variable, I have repeatedly told you this is for random initialization for a vanilla algorithm. Any arbitrary algorithm, linear and only doesn't matter. Here, it's a typical problem, linear problem you're solving. It's not a random initialization. I told you that we fix these equality constraints. The crossover mutations are also not vanilla algorithm operators. There is a lot of problem information put into it. When you are doing the customization, you don't need those large population size. You can drop it down. But then the onus on you is that what is that size? You have to do such a study before you give it to someone to use it. So we told them, let's not use 34. Why don't you use 40? So we said, use 40. So that's a little bit of cushion I have to not performing well. So 40 is something that we recommend. And here, it shows the number of function evaluations. You see the best we get with 34 and 40 little more, but still not too bad. But a little bit of more population doesn't harm you. Okay? So our recommendation is 40. But this tells you a critical population size is needed. And this kind of behavior is very, very typical. If your algorithm is good, you will see this. There will be a critical population below which you don't have enough performance, beyond which it doesn't matter. You're just doing extra computation if you're doing more than the critical size. Third slide. on. Is recombination needed? I'm trying to now understand each and every operator that I have told you in this, or we have set up in this. So here is again, all these are done on a million variable problem. So I now use different number of parents in the recombinations. So parent number one, when I set number of parents equal to one, what, do I, what am I doing? I'm actually not doing recombination. Because with one parent, it's the same one goes, right? Because there's nothing to compare with. So it's the same one. So one parent is default no recombination. It goes only, it relies only on the mutation, two mutation operators. Two onwards, you start the recombinations. What is three? Number of parent three means? I have three parents. Now I'm looking at the first heat, first row on all three and choosing the best one. There we did only for two with two parents. The so three, four, five parents, I could do any number of parents. Okay? And I expect it to be better, right? But look at what happens. It's two for this problem with the population size that we fixed, which was 60 in this case I fixed. Turned out that two is the optimum. But if I can increase this to 120, maybe 200, maybe three and four would be better because now I have more room. Because as you increase the number of parents, you are becoming more and more greedy. Because now you're taking more parents to figure out which is better. So you'll have less diversity left in your population. 
So, with 60 population size 2 is optimal because you see you get the minimum number of computational time, you get the result and this side have minimum number of heat updates which is very similar to function evaluations. Other also works, but takes more and more evaluations because you are losing the diversity with 60 members and then the algorithm has to wait more generations it has to have before it finds the optima and the variations are also more as you see. So, based on this study I will say 2 is the best, but what about 1 when I am not using recombination? Look at what is happening. I never get a feasible solution. So, these are this dash line here from here to the dash line means there is no feasible solution. So, this one no feasible solution was found. So, if I do not put a recombination, I do not get a feasible, the algorithm is not so efficient. So, I showed you that if I randomly do with just mutation on it, it is not good, but if I now go with the algorithm with the population, only thing I do mutation 1, mutation 2 to every one of them and then selection is choosing the better. If I do that mutation plus selection, it is also not efficient. So, recombination is absolutely important. That is the main operator that is giving you this recombine, recombination of two, two things or two or more good things from two parents or three parents into one child and that is really the main crux of this whole algorithm. It is very clear from this slide, right. The fourth one is I am showing you how the algorithm progresses towards the optima uh, because I suspected that as soon as I try to publish this kind of results with billion variable, there will be a lot of reviewers will say by chance <laughs> or how does it work such a billion. So, all this I am showing just to build confidence that there is a science behind all this. Okay? So, um, here I am showing with the iteration counter that means the generation number, how with 40 population size now, how the fitness is reducing. So, in this so fitness should be increasing, I do 1 minus the fitness, so that means this should be reducing. Now, you can see that when I have a this is in log scale, this is in normal scale, so it is a semi log. When you have a straight line on a semi log, performance is exponential. So, it is exponentially coming down towards the optima. There are several lines here, I think one of them is the average fitness of the population, other is the best fitness of the population, 1 minus the fitness in each case. And the best is slightly better than the average of course, but you see there is a phase up to 15 generations, um, there is one and then there is a very fast growth because what is happening is around that time there are lots of solutions in the population in the population that are very close to being feasible. They are almost very small violations. It took 15 generations for all the solutions, many solutions to come there. After they are there very quickly they can recombine and get a feasible and then the optimum. Okay? So, you see that um, up to even the 17th generation. I, I have some feasible because if you are here, then you are feasible, okay, 0 0.03 and less. If you are feasible, this is the target. Sorry. I will just uh, forgot to. Uh, what is happening? Okay. All right. So, you can see that. I stopped it. Let me. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so then, what happens is that when you are less than one, you are feasible. This is my target, and you see, it took us only about eighteen iterations to get the target solution, the best one coming there. Average is still infeasible but average is going to if you let it run it will come, but remember we quit as soon as you get one solution in the population which is the target value. So, that happens in 18. So, can you imagine a 1 million variable problem with 40 population size, I need only 18 iterations to find a 99.7 percent metal is a very good solution. So, you can imagine how fast it is and you can see that this shows that exponentially the points are getting towards the optima. Okay? Uh, we then do lot of classifications of different, so I figured on over many runs that there are three phases the algorithm goes through. There is a galloping phase, there is a consolidation phase and there is a culmination phase. 
Um, the galloping phase, all the infeasible solutions to start with, they are very fast getting towards the optima. It's galloping towards, that's why I call it. And then consolidation is now that you've come, it slows down a little bit. Then from there on, see in these problems, or any optimization problems, um, when you randomly create solutions, you are, there's, there's lots of solutions that are, give you a fitness value that is like a random fitness value, right? Now your algorithm, you're moving towards the peak. Let's say there's only one peak. Now, when you reach close to the peak, okay, you are above most of the search space now. Now, if you have to improve from there, it's a waiting game, right? Because many mutations, many kind of things you're doing, and you are all very difficult to improve. So let's say you've got a solution at 99.2%, and you want to go to 99.7. To go to 99.3, there are not many solutions that will give you 99.3. But when you are at 70%, there are many ways you can go to 80%. Many ways you can go to 80 to 85%. So it's easy. So that's why there is a galloping phase in the beginning. Very quickly, you can come near 90%, 95%. And after that, any improvement, because the search space with better solutions are also now less and less and less. Actually, they're exponentially less. So to hit into those, you have to slow down a little bit. You are not all the time you get it. And that's what happens here. You see that now this is actually saying how many offsprings are better than the previous population average. In my population, they are dropping a little bit because it's not always easy to create better solution than what you had in the previous generation. But here, almost 100% of my new solutions are better than previous generation. So I'm actually, all, every generation I'm creating all solutions better than all solutions I had before, in every generation. It's happening up to about 10 generations. But then it slows down, because I've already got pretty good solutions here now. Now I cannot keep on doing that. It slows down a little bit. And then in this phase, once all those are created, it's a matter of recombination. And then again, it speeds up. Okay? So there's these three phases I found when I do any, many, many different ways. I just find it. So this is, again, another showing that yeah, this is what is expected, and this is what the algorithm is showing. Okay. okay, so I give a lot of stress on why and how these things work. So there's a lot of slides there talking about it. At your spare time, you can look at it, okay? I'm going to now show you <laughs> this final one where there is this one B here, right? So this is the final summary of the whole thing. On the x-axis here, I go from 50,000 variables. That's my minimum because the company needed around there. And they're, they're not interested in this problem. So when I go from 50,000 up, I'm actually even going beyond the, what the practice is needed. Okay, This is becoming now academic. But if the company has many years of orders today, which can go up to 100,000 or 500,000 variables, they can do. My algorithm can give them solutions. But probably they would not do that way. So it gets a little impractical here. But just I'm trying to show the power of the algorithm. So 50 to 1 billion here, OK? But this is in um, log scale. This is also in log scale. When you get a straight line performance, it's a polynomial performance when you have log log and, and a linear. And you can see these points here. These are for every variable size, how much is the computational time that was needed. And we had to actually buy a special <coughs> computer with a large uh, RAM I'll just, in a minute, tell you why we need such a large RAM. But I don't know whether you can see, but there are two lines, actually, in each of them with the red. That shows the lower, the variations over 10 different runs, the lower and the upper side. Some of them you don't even see. It. Here you can see a little bit, but some of them you don't see, because the performance is pretty good. You don't have to run it 10 times. One time you run, second time you run, you get very similar time. And each one of them I terminate if I get a 99.7% or better utilization. So when I get a log log plot, a straight line with a slope of 1.11, that means the performance is order n to the power 1.11. It's not even square. It's not even quadratic. It's slightly more than linear. Okay. So this is a polynomial time performance. Now, when I presented this to a conference and one of the attendants says that you first told us it's a knapsack problem. And knapsack problems are NP-hard, which means you cannot find a polynomial time algorithm to solve it. And I'm showing here polynomial time performance. 
So, where is the contrast? So, it's a very good question, right? The answer is you need a poly, you need an exponential time to get to the optimum for these problems. This problem, if you ask me, I'm not happy with 99.7. Every time you have to give me the optimum. If that company person had told me that, I couldn't have solved even 50,000 variables so easily. But when he says, you know, a target of 99.7 is okay with me, that means I'm not interested in the actual optimum. I can find the polynomial time algorithm, and here it is. Okay, so that's what I was talking about. Once you fix the class of the problem, you can come up with the best algorithm. But the actual original problem solving may be more complex. So another way to look at it, I, as I'm saying, that this could be at most two kilos short of 650 kilos on an average, which anybody, any engineer would say, I'm fine. In fact, the guys were telling me you can go even 65 kilos less, right? But when the original one requires an exponential, that exponential time is needed from going from here to that maximum 2 kilo fix up. So it, it cannot be, may not be even 2 kilos. It may be, let's say, 1 kilo where the optimum is. Because I said 2 kilo is to go to 100%. But the actual optimum may be less than 100%. So just to get another 1 kilo or 1 and half kilo better result, you have to spend exponentially more time. So the 1 billion, it takes 6.2 days with our algorithm to solve. But it's still polynomial because 1 million to 1 billion, so 1 million is right here, 1 billion, it's a really large, I mean, we don't think in that range. So somebody when I was uh, presenting said, it's difficult to comprehend in 1 million, uh, 1 million to 1 billion, but I said, I come from a country with had more than a billion population. So I understand <laughs> how, how the numbers mean, OK? So I can see in that space, <laughs> but many people may not be able to see. Um, six, so you may think 6.2 days, I have to wait. But hey, I'm giving you one billion variable solution. He says, so what? But that means you don't understand the difference between one million and one billion. Because one million I give you in what seconds? One million I give you in about 10 minutes. One million in 10 minutes. 1 billion, 6.2 days. Do you see now the, the, how much big 1 billion is from 1 million? Yeah, so it's, it's really a huge thing. 1 billion variable search space. It's, anything can happen there, right? And then you may not be able to go there. So don't unnecessarily demand for getting the optima. Because you may have to spend your entire lifetime for a billion variable to solve it. But if you say, I want to be 2 kilos less or 1.5 kilos less from the optima, I can give you a very fast method like here, you know? So, and, and for all engineering purposes, this is pretty good. And then you have a fast methods to do it. Now let me talk a little bit about uh, why do we need a bigger computer. So let's, so we have to solve a billion variable. And this time scale study, because it's a time, I have to solve it on one computer. Because if I shift computers, then I cannot plot them in one, one graph, right? So if I take the largest one, one billion means 10 to the power 9. 10 to the power 9 x's are there. And they're real numbers. They're integers, not real number, integers. But how many bits are, how many bytes are needed to represent an integer? Do you know in a computer? It's four bytes. Four bytes per integer. So four times 10 to the 9 bytes to represent, to just store one solution in the computer. So that is four gigabytes. 10 to the power 9 means giga. So four gigabytes of RAM you just need to store one solution. So how many gigabytes do you have in your laptop or, or mobile? I'm sorry, or your, your desktop? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you can have 64 if you spend a little more money. And then we are talking about population size 60. So 60 times 4, each solution is 4 gigabyte. 60 solutions I have to store, so 240 gigabyte. And sometimes we need two populations, right? Because the old population and the new population, you don't want to mix it, mix it up. So, so we need 512 or more, OK? So this one has 16 times 16 GB DDR, but where is the RAM? Uh, 16 threads with 16 by 16 GB, that's the RAM. So this is 256. So what we did was we did a fast implementation of the integer. So integer, we don't use four bits. Actually, you could do some coding where you can use one byte to store an integer if the integer is not very big. Because our integers are what? How many copies? 
it can be maximum the size of um, how many copies you have to make, right? So it can be maybe 50, 60, 100, including 0. So there are not many options so we could do with 8 bytes, because 8 bytes you can go up to 256 options. So if you are less than 256, you can use 8 bytes. But coding becomes a little complicated. So my co-author in this is an Australian guy with uh, Christy Myborg. He is a Microsoft professional programmer, okay? Microsoft certified professional programmer. He knows programming like nobody else does. And so he, he came up with the most efficient way of implementing it. So that's why I'm, I'm happy to show you the computational time, because I don't think anybody can beat it, OK? Uh, because you, have, can I, you can have an algorithm, but if you have to code it, and I give it to various people, one can code it in a very lousy way. Each of the time can be we have to multiply it by four to get there, because there are unnecessary loops and stuff like that. But he trimmed everything off, whatever is bare minimum needed. But still, we needed a 256 gigabyte RAM to solve that billion variable problem. And so that's why we need to get a special, special computer. OK, but it's not the computer that's solving the problem. It's the algorithm that's solving the problem. Computer is reducing the time. You can still do it on your laptop, except that instead of 6.2 days, it may be one year. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested in one billion variable problem. But this is just to show that the algorithm scales. And I have no doubt that it might scale if you want to go even a tera, it should go. Because you see the, with the trend, you see the trend, you can just continue, I think. It just need, you just need a computer, uh, RAM to, to store all that stuff. We looked into the literature and see, is anybody solving billion variable? We found, yeah, there are people. In fact, Goldberg, Sastri, and, and one of his other student, in 2006, they came up with a compact GA. Um, so they went up to a billion variable here, you can see. But their problem was a different one. Their problem was a one max problem. It's much simpler than what we are doing. Ours is a, is a real in industry problem coming by. I just extended it, right? Integer programming problem. Theirs is also linear. It's one max problem means it's a binary. It's a Boolean variable problem. So they are using binary coded GA. Now, in a bit string, there can be zeros and ones, right? So the fitness of a string is just count the number of ones and then maximize that. So what is the best solution? All ones. All ones will have the maximum number of ones. All zeros is the worst solution. If you have 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, then its fitness is 1, because there's only one one. So simply count the number of ones, and you maximize that. So it's a linear problem. But they put some kind of noise into it. The fitness need not be just the count, but there is a noise that's added with the Gaussian um, noise there. And their goal was, so if you randomly create a string, how many ones there would be? So if you randomly create, uh, so it's a, let's say, 1 million variable or 1 billion variable problem, 1 billion bits, you randomly create. How many ones you're expecting? Yeah, 50% of 1 billion. And their goal was, if you get a 50.1% ones, you stop. Okay. So basically, they, it's not a very hard task, right, as you see it. But there's a noise that comes that makes it a little difficult because your fitness information is not very crisp. So that's the difficulty. But the termination is, is so ideally, it should have been 100%. By with the noise, you'll never get 100%. But their goal was also 50.1. So my idea was that they are trying to show that their algorithm scales to that, uh, that level. But already it's a bit of time. And they were using supercomputers to solve it. But if you go to 100 Person convergence, you need more time. But, but this was another problem which was attempted using a compact GA. Uh, then there are other people, they followed up Goldberg's work and tried to improve. So they went up to um, a little more improvement from this. But, but I think none of them really came to close to solving an industrial problem like we have with integers. So to my mind, I think this is one of the largest applications so far taken from, you know, taken from uh, practice. And this is another last slide on this, is to show that <coughs> I kept my target here 99.7, right right here. So I did one more here. So I actually did a study. If I had kept the eta to be 95%, 200, very close to, I went up to 99.9%. Look at the performance now. This is in log log scales. Uh, I'm sorry, log and normal. So any straight line will be exponential. 
This is even more than, worse than exponential. So it's worse than exponential. There's nothing like worse than exponential. It's just that power of exponent goes up. So this performance, any of these lines, time or heat up that is showing, it's really you need exponentially more time if you want to get closer and closer to the optima. I don't know in these problems where the optima is, whether it's 99.99999, I don't know. But I, I ended it up 99.9%. But to just to show you that it exponentially gets harder. So the person who asked me the question, I did that after that, just to convince myself that he is right, I am right, that this is a problem which is exponentially more hard if you want to get to the optima. Optima would be somewhere even closer to 1, between 99.9 .9 and 100%. I don't know where that is, but you can, you can extrapolate. And you see that it's exponentially getting harder. But if you set up any target, you can come up with a method to get there polynomially. Okay, So that's the whole point of, um, of optimization is that are you really interested in the optima or are you happy with the approximate one and then what you can do? It turns out that this algorithm that you came up with is a bit more generic. It can solve uh, more generic uh, problems. So we are currently investigating some of these more generic stuff and uh, whether we have very similar scale up problems or not. Any question for this application? And some of you are asking me about one problem going over. So does that convince you? I think you are asking or someone was asking me. Does this show the formulation as well as the algorithm development and analysis and how you're going to present your work? This actually does everything, right? So um, this should be the this should be a maybe standard idea in your mind that if you get a new problem, your thesis problem or whatever to solve. So along the process, some of you are thinking, I don't work in optimization. I don't want to develop an optimization algorithm. I want to just use it. But unfortunately, there's nothing like that, that you want to just use it. It's not a finite element method that it's well established and you can generalize it and so on and so forth. As you see, some customization is needed in order to efficiently solve it. It's not a negative thing I'm saying. I mean, this is the fact. The question then is, are you really want to optimize? How much do you sacrifice by not optimizing? And I'm showing you in these things, 70% of what the guy, the person was using on his Excel, not doing any optimization, to 99.7%. 70% means 30% off. So 650, 30% take out. How much of that is? It's a really, really bad solution. He could have not wasted so much heat, OK? So if you see that kind of trade-off, then it tells you that whether you're interested or not. If you're interested, this is the only way to go. If you have a large scale problem, complexity there in the problem, you have to customize. And then to customize, to have the knowledge how to customize, you need to take such a course. You need to also read some other stuff. Just taking the course is not enough. You're getting some ideas, but if you had the same, exactly the same problem, then you could exactly follow what I've done use the same method, but it may not be exactly the same, right? Uh, then you know what to do. So that's the thing I want to tell you, is that uh, there is a learning process, there is an investigation process, there is a customization process for practical problem solving, OK? OK, the time that I have, I want to talk about multimodal optimization. Uh, we've been, yeah, question? Yeah. Definitely. So this one, we are using some parallel cores, as you have seen, 16 core. Because we have 60 processors, so each of these we, sorry, 60 population size. And I think he's using 60 processors, 16 threads. So he's sending um, 16 of them at a time to each of the threads. And they're all getting evaluated. And then next batch of 16. So you can get a speed up of about 16 from a serial to this. With all that, I'm getting 6.2 days. So if it was a serial computer, it would have been 16 times that. So you increase the number of threads? Yeah, then you'll get almost linear speed up because it's just the communication time. Um, so if the calculation of the fitness is, is takes more time because there are so many variables you have to check and compute, uh, you can actually get almost linear speed up. So that's another advantage of these methods. Any other question? OK, multimodal. So what is multimodal? How is it different from all the stuff that we talked about so far? In multimodal, you have a function that looks like this. And I'm showing you with respect to a single variable x. And here is the 
uh, for fitness, in this case, let's say I'm trying to maximize efficiency of the system. X could be one of the control parameters or one of the settings or parameters that you can you can change. And when you change it, your function value changes. Looks like there are four different settings that gives you local optima. Two of them gives you the best optima, but they are almost similar. So either you can do it this way or that way and get the same result. You can do this way, that way, you don't get the same efficiency, but that's locally speaking, that is the best because no other local change here is going to make it as good as that. So that sense, it's a local solution. In multimodal optimization, we are interested in finding not only one of them, but all of them, or as many of them as possible. If there are 1,000 optima, I'm not interested in all 1,000. So give me the top, maybe five, or top 10 of them. And that's for a designer's point of view. For an operator's point of view, these are very good information to keep. Because you can switch from one optima to the other. One of the ways you switch is that if your competitors, so let's say you, you have currently put this solution out, this X, and all your products, you have that solution. As you know, as soon as, if you're the leader, you come up with a design, there are a lot of imitators these days, right? They will, uh, you know, inverse engineering, they will do reverse engineering and find out how you have done it, and they'll start producing their own. Well, when that happens, you switch to this optima, okay? So if you know that, and then they have to learn again of how you're doing this. If there are mul more optima, you know, you can keep switching, and they will be just wondering, how are they finding all these equally good solutions? So multimodal ET, not only from this way, but sometimes there are regulations by the government, material uh, availability. Uh, this solution may require a material which comes from some other foreign country, for example. We don't produce it in India. So then you're relying on it. Now the customs regulations have gone up that you have to pay more tax or something. If you have another solution which requires a different kind of material, maybe another source, and that route is still open, you can switch to it, right? Those are, of course, for implementation point of view, but the knowledge that you get, gain for your problem, that you have this solution, that solution, and these two solutions, there are various ways of solving. The knowledge that you gain is really unparalleled, is really priceless, that knowledge, right? So if you are in that business, you want to do this once and for all and just figure out what are different ways of solving it. So now we are talking about an optimization where our goal is not one optimal solutions, but number of optimal solutions, okay? So again, if you look at now the classical way of solving it, how will you do? Well, they cannot find multiple solutions because they start with one point, go to another point. So let's say you started from here and it will climb the hill with steepest descent or anything, then you get that. And then the optimal condition is satisfied, you quit, okay? You know there are other optima, so what do you do now? Now that you found this, you start with a completely different solution, maybe here, and you climb up and you get that. Now that you found two, you go completely different from these two, maybe you end up here and you get that. And then you could be end up here and then you'll get the same one back. So this is a complete waste because you don't know where the solutions are going, okay? So this is how you do. There are other methods like squashing functions and all that. Once you find this, you modify the, modify the objective function. You multiply with a function that may go like a parabola here and multiply with it so that this one comes down to zero. So this is now a bad solution so that your algorithm don't get there anymore. So these squashing functions, when you put multiple of them, can create artificial minima, maxima. So those are like fix-ups. Those are not actually solving the original problem without any fix-up. Now that you need to find the number of solutions, evolutionary algorithm use a population, so this is a good match, right? I can do some change in my population so that every population member is a different optimum eventually. Or there is subpopulations for each optima that I naturally create. So when you look at this problem, Goldberg and one of his students, uh, Richardson, first looked at it in 1987, long time ago. How is this problem similar to nature? If you look at it, okay, animals, humans, birds, uh, amphibians, these are all different niches that nature has created. So we don't go to forests that much and, dis and kind of disturb the animals so they can live there. They have their own, own kind of niche there. And we, are, we need a different kind of environment, food, to survive and we have created our own niche, right? Like that, birds and all that. So this is another way of saying animals, humans, birds, these are all different peaks. 
they may not all have in some objective function the same value. They could be local, some could be global, but these are different niches, different optima. How is nature solved it? In a broad way, by sharing resources. That means this land, for example, food. We don't encroach in each other's land. If you do, then there will be just one, one niche that is going to survive. Okay? But if you share it, you say, okay, this is your niche, this is my niche, then separate evolution can take place. And there can be coexistence of different optima, coexistence of different niche, right? So that was the idea, very broad idea Goldberg had. So he defined a function he called sharing function, okay? So that says the x-axis is a, is a dissimilarity index. So it's a distance from me. So this is me, one of the population member. If anybody is a clone of me in the population, I have a distance from it zero, or that one has a distance from me zero. All other that are not exactly same as me will have some distance, some difference with me. And I can do it in the x space. I can look at the Euclidean distance between the two vectors, right? So that is that. And now he says, OK, let's put a function called sharing function, where it may go down like this. At 0, when you have no difference with another person, you have 100% share, sharing power with, with the clone of yours. You can, we can tolerate up to a difference of sigma, which is a parameter now. If you go more than sigma, you are totally dissimilar. Right? It could be one animal compared with one human. They're totally different food habits, where they want to stay in terms of land, completely different. They have no effect on each other, zero person sharing effect. But one human with another human may be close to this. They are close. They are within sigma. Once you have that, now if I have few population members on the same landscape, and my goal is to find all the optima, each one of them, he says, go around and look into the population, how many are within sigma of yours. Okay? And then the sharing function tells you that if you are so much difference, you have maybe 90% sharing. If you have so much difference, maybe you have 20% difference. So you get that percentage shared uh, number. It's called uh, niche count. That will come a little later. I'm going to share, tell you that. So you can get it from it. So for example, this optima seems to be crowded quite a bit in my current population. These are all population members. This one just alone is representing this pick. So this is not crowded. There is nobody around it. So when you do this, you count yourself. So each sharing distance for this is going to be just one, because it's, you're comparing itself with itself. Here, the crowding distance, when you sum up for all of them, may be four or five. Okay? So the way to do this is this. Here is the generic sharing function description. Usually, we use alpha equal to one. And there is a mistake here. Please correct this. I have to correct it at some point. This is, should be sigma. If dij is less than sigma, then we use this. Otherwise, it's zero. So this alpha here should be sigma. And here are the sketches again. Now the way you do is go by the population and compute the, sh the distance with each other and plug it in this formula and you get the sharing distance value. And that's a number always between 0 and 1. And you keep adding this for all population members. This number is called the niche count. It actually gives an account of how many individuals are around you. Okay? And then what you do is divide the actual fitness of the individual eye by its niche count. So this assumes that you are maximizing. That's the first thing I have to tell you. This assumes, this sharing function approach assumes you are maximizing. Um, and we're dealing with positive fitness, okay? positive or zero fitness. Let me show it with an example. Remember the sine pi x. We have, I think we did sine x. But here I'm doing sine pi x. But I put a mod sign now. And I'm going x 0 to 2 means sine 0 to sine 2 pi, actually, I'll be having. So the sine function is going like this, right? When I take a mod. The negative part becomes positive, so you have two optima. <clears throat> so I deliberately created a problem having two optima with equal fitness of one. So it's called a multimodal optimization because there are multiple optima, and I'm interested in finding both now. So my result will be 0.5 and 1.5, my optimal result. Okay, But I'm not going to go to the result. I'm just going to show you how this niching idea or the sharing idea works. Okay. First thing I do is create some population at random. So this is I'm trying to do, let's say, binary coded GA. So x is coded in binary strings. So I've got some six-bit strings here. I've decided to have six bits. Okay, randomly created ones and zeros. I decode them to get x, map between zero and two. You are familiar with all that now. And I compute the function value by using this, and these are the values. And these points x I'm showing you here. 
these are the 6 points 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. Now, these are the function values. If I am not using niching or sharing method, I will be using roulette wheel, proportionate selection or tournament selection with these fixed fitness values. Right? Okay. Now, in the, when I am trying to find multiple things, that is where you have to defer. Your selection mechanism has to be changed. So what, what we are doing, first you need to find the niche count. How do we find it? Okay. For every variable, go and check with every other population, sorry, every population member, go and check with, check with every other population members in the population and take the difference. If it is less than sigma, sigma you have to set, then you go at the sharing function calculation. If it is more than sigma, then they are dissimilar, do not have to do, add a 0. Okay. So let us say sigma, I think here I fixed to be 0.5. I did not say it here, but sigma was used to be 0.5 here. So now let us do that. This solution to itself first. So 1.651 to itself, the difference is 0. 0 is less than sigma, so I have a niche count of 1, sharing function value of 1. So 1 is there. Plus, I take the difference between the two. What is the difference roughly? Let us say 0 0.3. 0 0.3 is less than 0.5. So now I have to go to the sharing function and compute. It will be somewhere around 0 0.3, 0 0.5 or something. So then 1 plus this number. Okay. Then go to this with that. What is the difference? It is more than 0.5, so 0 is added. This to this, again 0 is added. This to this, some value will be added. This to this, some value will be added and you get the total count is 2.856 when you add all of them up. So let us look at 1.651 which is the number 1 which is here. Okay. When you go from 1 with 0.5, so this is about 1.6 something, so you are not even coming here. So 3 and 4 is not in the niche of 1, but 2, 6 and 5 are. And the 5 will have the maximum effect on the sh sharing function because its distance is very small and the 2 will have the largest effect. I am sorry, smallest effect. Sharing function will be very small because the distance is large. And sharing function is always going down with the distance, right? You get that. Similarly, you can get these, these, these. So you expect these values to be at least 1, is it not? Because with itself is always 1, so it will be always 1 plus or 1 at the minimum. This one, for example, 4, where is 4? Here. If you go around 0.5, there is nobody, even not, not this one. So it is not sharing with anybody. So its niche count is just 1. Is that clear? Okay. Now that I have done that, it is a maximization problem with positive fitness. I divide Fi by NCI. This by this I put here. This by this I put here. Right? This is the whole idea of niching. I am sharing the fitness. And these are the corresponding values, these Fi dash values. This 4 1, 4 to 1, 0 0.891 is still divided by 1. So I get 0 0.89. So it stays there. But all these 4 1s, they have total 4, it is crowded. So their niche counts are what? About 3. All of them you see about 3. This 1, 2 and 5, 4. 1, 2 and 5, 6. They are about 3. So it says another, about 3 other people are there around you. So your fitness gets, although your fitness is high, because see they are very high fitness, but your fitness now got divided by 3 and you got about 0 0.3. Now you do proportionate selection with this. Which one will get emphasized? because it has no copies. Since I have divided its fitness by number of people around it, I actually had kept it in its own place and these ones have gone down saying this is the best. So now the GA is looking the fitness function not this solid line, but as a unimodal function with, with like this. Okay? So that means it will emphasize that now in the next generation this will have maybe two or three copies in the proportional selection and it will mate with others and suddenly you see one or two more copies will come here. So as soon as some peak has less number of copies, this mechanism brings, emphasizes that, allows it to cross with other members so that it can bring more, more copies at the expense of these copies. Because here it says, oh, there are four of them. I can afford to lose one or two because there are four of them representing the peak. So that's what happens when you do this kind of changes. Okay? So they're pretty smart when they design this whole thing. And I had implemented, this was actually my master's thesis when I worked on sizing the parameters and kind of developed it a little further. Um, so this is, uh, this is the result from my master's thesis back then. So you have a function that looks like this, okay? 
and there are five picks, but you see there are one global and all local. If I don't do any sharing, the standard GA, you expect it to go to the global. All 100, there are 100 members, all goes to the global Optima. Okay, it doesn't care about the others because eventually it will go there. That's the, if you keep on running, that's the, that's the quality of GA. That's always going to improve and improve. Now I do sharing with this and now look at the result. Okay, I've got some members here, some member here, here, and so all five peaks are represented now. And I can keep on running. Here is this, here is the um, plot of number of copies in each peak. And you can see that they are almost about 20, around that's 100 populations. So all the peaks are there. This is the result with the no sharing case. Only one of them takes over and get all 100 members there. The rest all of them are there initially, but then they drop. Okay? So sharing can go from here to there. It can just undo everything and keep a presence of every peak over there, whether you have local or global. Then we did some theory to figure out, can it do, um, can, it, can, it, can I get it down to a low, very low here? So the ratio between this and this is very high. Still you can get there? Uh, the answer is no. The, the ratio of this is important for the population size that you have. If you have so if the ratio is very high, you need a very high population size for it, for, it to have, for, it, for you to find this. So if you fix a population size and you don't know how many peaks are there, it will get adjusted and maybe give you two or three peaks. It depends on the ratio of the peaks. Okay? But you will get more than one peak. If the first one and the second one is not too big, okay? you will always get more than one peak. Okay, then there is a sizing issue. How, do you, how shall we size sigma? Because that turns out to be an important parameter. There we set 0.5 from the problem information, but uh, we suggested a way to size sigma based on the dimension of the problem and how many peaks you are anticipating, how many peaks you are interested in finding. That's the Q. And P is the dimension of the search space, so you can size sigma share. Uh, there are papers you can you know, look at and read and, and figure out more information. After this work was done, people are interested. Uh, some applications also took place in civil engineering, mechanical engineering problems where there are multiple optima. Um, few other methods also came out, like clearing, clustering, crowding. These are other ways of doing it. Again, I'm not going to go in, uh, in all of them. Uh, so, I, so there was another student who worked, on, worked with me on this uh, multimodal thing, and he had really made a huge comparison with various methods that existed, and he suggested a modified clearing approach, which seemed to have worked much better. So these are 50 peak problems, 20 peak problems, and uh, this still works. Um, there is a need for mating restrictions when you do <coughs> sharing. The reason is that um, if you take one point from here and another point from here and you have a mating, a crossover, that can fall over here, right? Because when you have multiple peaks crossing over, maybe detrimental, maybe useful, but most often they'll be detrimental, right? So you need to restrict your mating. So you say, okay, I only mate two individuals when they're from the same peak so that there is more focused search here and can get to the optima better. So you can see that from such a performance, you can get down to such a performance. So this means that all five peaks have got almost equal number of points. So there is equal representation. This one has a little variation, goes from 17 to about 21, 22. But here, it's either 19 or 20 or 21, something like that. So, so you get much better performance and things happen a bit quicker when you do the mating restriction. So all you have to do is, first parent you choose at random from the population, second parent is not random. Second parent you then say, within the sigma share. Or I, we introduced another parameter called sigma mating, but eventually we said, let's keep it same. So within the sigma, if you have to another parent, then you utilize for mating. So that's called the mating restriction. That's needed to not have little bad solutions created out of crossover. Mutation you can do, too, because it's an individual thing. You can just do on any one of them. OK, that's it. Then we go to a different topic. OK, so what we did today was finished up the evolution strategy part, which was another real coded evolutionary methods. Uh, then we came to showing you one industrial problems and how you can formulate, test it with the existing methods, and design with a calculator. Then compute FX. One point. 
it should be between 0 and 2 otherwise you have done a mistake in calculation. So 1.390 do up to 3 decimal places I think. Um, others please calculate as well if you have a calculator anything you do will give you a practice. Next one everybody is getting that. Okay, now let us compute f x is sin square pi x. Now, pi times x should be in radian. So, whatever x you multiply to pi that will be radian or you can multiply you can substitute pi with 180, 180 times x and then do and do in degree either way. If you are using pi then you should use radian. <coughs> so, this is sin square pi x sin square pi x point ok. Should be Zero six one one eight. Okay. That is not a very good solution then, third one. Next one. Wow, that is a very good solution because the maximum is 1 right. This one should be close. Nine zero. So, now you have done all the basic calculations. We got x, we got f x. Now, we are ready to do niche count. How do we do niche count? So, let us call that niche count n c and for x. So, we will be having for each one of them we will be looking at the distance from each other and corresponding sharing function. Now, sharing function s h d will be 1 minus d over sigma if uh, sigma share let us write the whole thing if d is if d is less than equal to sigma share 0 otherwise. This is how sharing function is defined. D is the distance between the Euclidean distance between two solutions. So, there will be this since there are 6 there will be 6 terms that we have to add. So, let us take the first one let me do the first one and then you do the rest of them. First one we have to look at the x. So, we only have to look at x nothing else only the x column here and first is the distance with itself. So, which is 0. So, 0 d means 1. So, we always have 1 plus let us take the next one what is the distance between them if it is less than sigma share sigma share is equal to 0.5. Okay. So, if the difference is less than 0.5 then you come over here put that difference divide by 0.5 1 minus that tell me and I am going to put it here. So, this looks to me is less than 0.5. So, what is the difference? 0.318 plug it in here d is 0.318 sigma share is 0.5. So, 0.318 divided by 0.5 that one 1 minus. So, 1 minus that is 0.364 ok 0.364 plus now x 1 the first one with the third one the difference I see is more than 0.5. So, it will be 0 because this comes into play right plus 
one with fourth also more than 0.5 distance another 0 plus fifth one is less than 0.5 so first compute the distance difference and then plug it in here like that Point six one eight. That's the golden number, right? Okay. Plus the first and the last one. Seems to me less than point five. Point four nine two. Equal to what now? So there should be six terms here. When you add them, that that is what is niche count. Mm -mm. It won't be two point. It's point three six four plus point six one eight plus point four nine two. Oh, plus one. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, could be plus one. Two point. How much? Four seven four. Okay. So that's the niche count. Now let's keep doing for the second one. Now second one, you'll be taking difference always from the second one. So, second one to first one, you do not have to compute, it is already here. Second one to first one is the same. 1 to 2 is same as 2 to 1, not minus, it is always plus. So, 0 0.364 is absolute difference you have to take. Plus 1, plus you do second with third. Is there a 0.5 difference? Yeah, it is within 0.5, so there will be a non zero number. It is less than 0.5, I think. Uh, yeah. 10.5. So, take the absolute difference, eh? not negative. 0 0.04 plus second with third, which is 0, right? Plus second with fourth, there will be a dif difference less than 0.5. <laughs> Point seven four six, yeah, yeah. Point seven four six plus second one with fifth one. No, second one with last one. Yeah, it's also less than point five. Eight five nine, eight seven two. Add them. Okay. Like that, complete the other. So we can get a lot of things from from up already. Three to three to one, I already have zero, right? Three to two, I already have here two to three, which point zero four eight. Three to three itself is one. Plus three to four now you need to compute, and that's. Uh, not within 0.5, not within 0.5, right? So, 0 plus 3 with 5, it is also not within 0 0.5, plus 3 to 6, is it? It is also not. So, that is easy. So, we just have 1.048 here. This little contribution from the second one to third one, that is it. Okay. Then, fourth one. Again, 4 to 1, I already have, which is 0, plus 4 to 2, is same as 2 to 4, 0, plus 4 to 3, same as 3 to 4, 
which is I am sorry 4 to 3 now is 0 also plus 1 plus 1 to 4 to 5 0 plus 0. So, it is 1 because clearly there is nothing around 0 0.349 within 0 0.5. Okay. Then fifth one 5 to 1 I have got 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 5 0 0.618 plus 1 2 to 5 0 0.746 plus 0 plus 0 again plus 1 plus this one you have to do this one will be high Okay. Yeah, it should be three point two three eight. One is there. Okay. Now for the last one, one point four six one point seven, we have point four nine two plus all the last ones. Point eight seven two plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0.874 plus 1 equal to. So, if we actually do one one half of this, the other half you can just take it. How much? Identical. Could be just a chance it just happened. Hmm? I don't know what you mean equidistant from these are these are niche count values that become identical uh, it's a linear way we are doing so it can become okay all right so now that I've got niche count I can compute f dash x which is the shared fitness and this is the shared fitness which will be simply f x over n c x So, you can compute that now 0 0.624 by 2.474 like that. Two five two. This one is also like that 295. This is 0 0.05 or 6. 8. This one is 0 0.791 divided by 1. Then the fifth one and the last one. What is the cost question? Niche count. Hmm? 5 9? Okay. All right. Everyone got it? How to do? Okay. One second. Let me get my power back here. Okay. So, the first part is just that. Uh, present your results in a tabular format, calculate the niche count and the shared fitness. So, these are the two columns we have got. Now, if you just look at it, um, the best solution here is the fourth one, right? 0 0.791. First of all, it is an isolated one and it has a large value 0 0.791. The optimum is at 1, we know for this problem. So, it is a good solution, but only one, one solution representing. So, this calculation makes it the best. So, we do not want to lose it because this is just one solution representing one of the peaks. And then there are solutions at the other places which are other peak which is this 5, 6, 1 and somewhat 2. So, 1, 2, 5, 6 they belong to one peak 
and the fourth belong to the other peak. The third one is, is in the middle, which is not a good solution because f is not very good. So, you can see that 1, 2, 5 and 6 have got very low fitness now. Okay? So, some of them will survive, maybe one or two will survive, but not all of them will survive, but that is not a problem because there are four representative, two, two survives that is good, but at least the one that is isolated I do not want to lose. But if you are done if you are done sharing base study, if you are done proportionate selection by this fit fitness, then seventh one is not the best one, right? There is a 995, there is a 984, 896. So, this is actually the third best or fourth best. So, there is some chance that you will lose it and then you lost that whole optima. But this method makes it the best. So, now you can never lose it, right? By the way, this whole method sharing function method that we talked about works only with proportionate selection whole theory is about that. It will not work with, you cannot do tournament selection with this. You have to use proportionate selection. So, this is one thing you have to note, <coughs> proportionate selection. Okay. Let us look at the second part. Determine how many copies are expected in the population. So, if this is the population at generation t, how many copies are expected in the population by action of proportionate selection alone? So, if you do not do any crossover mutation, just proportionate selection alone in the left half and the right half of the search space for the following two cases without sharing and with sharing. So, if we plot this thing, 0 is here, 2 is here, 1 is here okay? and <coughs> sin square pi x is going to be sin pi will be 0. So, it is like this, right? It's very similar to the one we take. There we would take a mod, here we do a square they will be the same same peak, okay, same height. So, this is your f x and here is one optima, here is another one, they will be just symmetric. So, this is at 0 0.5 and this optima is at 1.5, right. These are the two optima. Okay. Now, if I take the left half, what is the schema for the left half? There are 6 bits here. So, what is the schema that represents the left half? 1 all star will start from 32, 0, 0 all star, 5 star. This is the schema that represents the left half. Is it okay with everybody? And 1 all star on the other half. So, left half and right half. This is left, that is right. Okay. Now, it says, how many copies are expected in the next population if I just do proportionate selection for the left half of the search space? So, let us do without sharing first, A, without sharing. So, that means I am not going to be using all this calculation. I am only going to be using f x, right? Okay. So, if this is my fitness, I am doing proportionate selection. How many copies will the left half get after the proportionate selection? Remember what was it? It was m h t times f h over f bar. That is the selection effect, proportionate selection effect. The rest of the stuff I had with 1 minus all that, that is the crossover mutation effect. So, if I am not doing crossover mutation for now and I am interested how much copies it will get after proportionate selection, this is what it is. So, m h t and this is exact. The inequality comes in because the crossover mutation was not exact, but this is exact. Okay? So, I can put an equality sign. So, now tell me if my h is, if my h is 0 and all star, let us call that 0, h 0 and h 1 we will call it 1 star, all star. So, if I put h equal to h 0, what will be this? What is m h 0 t? First, you have to see here in the population, m h 0 is 2 and then what is the f h then? I have to look at f x, average of the two, average of the two. So, can you tell me that? 0 0.062 plus 0 0.791 by 2. 0.426. And then what is f bar? You can always compute f bar here. It is the average of the whole thing. Okay. So, we put 0.725. So, how much is this? One 
and this is exact this is not greater than or less than so it's expected number of course so you see you had two copies here in this population next generation you are going to lose it lose at least lose one sometimes if you do it many times sometimes you lose and you'll have one very few times you are going to have two copies of that most of the time you'll have one copy so this particular one is going to lose if you use this population to continue with proportionate selection only you're going to lose now if crossover mutation has the power to bring in something here it can bring in but selection effect is to reduce the number of copies it's simply because this solution here is too too low it's 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 dropping its chance of increasing the number of points by proportionate selection let's do mh1 t plus 1 so how many copies we have four initial population and then what is the fitness of the that schema so that means fitness of average of 1 2 5 and 6 is that clear to some of you there the way to compute the fitness of a schema is go and look in the population which string represents it and take the average of those fitnesses. 0 0.874 here and now it is going to be more than 4 I think 4.826. So, most of the time you will be creating 5 copies by proportionate selection and sometimes very few times you are going to do 4. So, that is going to increase. Why is that? If we try to look at these points where they are, so x 1.714 that is 0.1, then 1.396 which is here, 2, 0.92 which is here, 3, 0.349 here which is 4, 1.523, 5 and 6 is 1.46 here, 6. So, you see there are four points are crowding around the second optima, the right side optima. There is only one close to the first optima and third one is not so good. Okay? So, if we just do without any sharing, uh, because this one star star star, there are four points that are pretty good fitness, okay? it is going to win. It is going to win over and eventually you are going to lose this part. So, this is going to go there and you are eventually you will have no representative on 0 star star star. Yeah, you will eventually get 1 and the fact that you will get that one because we have more representative of that to start with. So, there is always some kind of little bias towards 1 and everything goes towards that. This is also in nature called genetic drift. If you have two species which are almost equally powerful, uh, a slight difference in something, let us say there is one extra member of that family is there, it is going to take over eventually. or the environment is such that it favors slightly more to one species that is going to take over. So, this is called genetic drift. It also happens in nature when two things are equally powerful, you do not know which way it will go. So, one of the thing is do you have similar number of copies to start with? If you have similar number of copies to start with, then it depends on you know crossover and mutation this, this stochastic, this random numbers that you are talking about, where it is falling, slight advantage in one direction is going to take it over. Okay. This genetic drift usually takes time, it is much more, it is less powerful than evolution. Okay. It slowly happens in, 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 in nature. Uh, we see that happening here also. If you do not do this, I mean here it is a big difference like twice the amount, what you have is twice the amount. Let us say you have 100 population size and here you have got 49 and here you have got 51. Okay. You will see and their equal fitness, if you just run it, you are going to see it is going to take maybe about 70, 80, 100 generations before everything goes to that one. Because there is not much selective advantage. Here there are good solutions, here there are good solutions, but just one number more here. That effect to show up eventually all this to vanish here takes a lot of time. So, genetic drift usually is pretty, pretty slow. Evolution is not that slow. Evolution can like if this was like this okay, and that and you have equal number even here or even you have one or two more here. Even then very quickly you will see all points are coming here. 
So that's the effect of evolution, okay? With all the crossover mutation selection that we have. But when they're equal, uh, there is no selective advantage. Now it depends on stochasticities and where you had some bias, and that's going to take over, okay? Now, yeah. Oh, how it will take over by genetic drift? Um, yeah, because here are there are four points, here there are two points, right? So we have a first of all a s imbalance in the starting point, okay? So naturally this is more biased. So if you don't do anything, any special thing like sharing or anything, just use the original binary coded GA, uh, you see what's going to happen, right? These ones have high. What did I do? Yeah, here. So there are four copies. Now there will be five copies. How will it get five copies? One of them has to die, and that copy will come here. Most likely, this is going to die. Okay, next generations will have a different thing. You will see that the five will become six. Where will it come from? Is this guy will go there. So in one or two iterations, you will see all of them have gone there. Once all of them have gone there, everyone has got one in their first position. You can never be here unless a mutation take place, takes place on that one, and it makes it a zero. And we do it with a small probability of mutation because in this case you thought I should do it large mutation so that it falls. But large mutation to this one, large mutation to this one, large mutation to this one is not going to be good. Large mutation of this one happens to be good if you want this peak, but you don't know beforehand what. That's why you use a small mutation. So there is a waiting time when this one will become zero. If you don't use mutation, only recombin recombination and selection. Once everything is gone here in this le right half, you can never get back to the left, left half. Because one can never be zero. The only way you can get back here is if you have a zero here. But when everything is one in your population at that place, only mutation can change it. So these are some things you have to understand what goes on. And without selection, you are doomed to only get to one of these, this optima and not that. Okay? Although you have equal importance. Now let's do, mm, I don't have any more space here. Can you do the B? Let's do B now with sharing. M H 0 T plus 1. Now I'm going to be using F dash X. All the F dash X as fitness, not with the F X. So this is still 2 T plus 1. 2 times, what is the average here? 684? 334. 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, OK. Now, what is the fitness of H0 schema? That's 0 0.059 plus 0 0.791 divided by 2, right? Point Average of the 2. Point? OK, now compute this. And one last huh, point. 5, 3, 6. See, now two copies will get increased to three copies. And if you do H1, is the average of first two and the last two altogether. So average of 0 0.252, 0 0.295, 0 0.307, and 0 0.303. Multiply to 4, this ratio. So there will be a drop, right? So there are four copies. When you do with fitness, proportional selection with these fitnesses, F dash, one has to be sacrificed now. So that means one will go over here, because this has to be three, this has to be three. So now you see uh, you are going to have a balance. And if you continue to do this one or more two iterations, you will see that this one will now get crowded. This one will get less crowded. So there is next iterations on, some of them will go over here. So this kind of um, 
and uh, you know non stationary balance is going to take take place till you run it it's never going to die down because as soon as you have some points are getting depleted from one of the peaks that suddenly gets importance and more points come there at the expense of another peak then that gets depleted so again some points will go there so this kind of balance you know will keep on happening when you do this right so i showed you how to compute the f dash x here and also from the schema analysis we see which is going to get more importance more copies so you get an idea how the with the proportional selection the whole thing will work right so this is question 2 exercise 7 okay yes multimodal problem you do this you do this division so the idea is that okay you've got a problem you don't know whether there is one optima two optima but it's the it's your wish are you going to find multiple solutions if there is so you say no i'm still interested in the global one optima then you don't have to do niching so but if there is only one optima optimal solution and another is just just slightly below it doesn't matter even if you do this it's not going to matter because everything gets reduced so the relative relative importance stays so if 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 there is one optima and still using the niching this is not a problem it will take a lot of time because the niching is one way you are maintaining diversity, right? As something is getting crowded, you are making it loose. So it's a way to preserve diversity. Sometimes we do use niching even for finding single optima for very complex problems where it's very difficult to search and find good regions. So niching can help you. So this is one of the ways to maintain diversity. Other ways to maintain diversity is increasing mutation strength, but mutation strength and mutation probability. But that's a that means you are going towards randomness. And this is a very calculated way of doing it. You found some region which is crowded, then you take it out and go to less crowded regions and uh, uh, put more copies because that's unexplored, relatively unexplored space. You have suddenly gone there, let's say by crossover or mutation. This is the only one there. And it so happens it has a high fitness, right? So chances are that around it are also high fitness. So this allows you to create more points there because that gets emphasized by crossover mutation you'll be creating that so this is a good thing for exploration purposes even though you're not finding multiple solutions so just for exploration purposes yeah mutation rate increase is the last choice you should do because that's you don't know which bit to mutate more often so you have to do just uniformly everything and that destroyed some good things and it can also bring in some good things but usually only certain bits you have to change to get good things. Rest all you should not change. So, so you don't know. So by mutation, you are actually destroying a lot of good things in the hope of getting good things out of it. So that's why I said this is the last choice that you should have. But these are more functionally doing it. And these are anytime recommended. Sometimes even we do a multi-objective optimization for a single objective by throwing in an additional objective just for maintaining diversity. Those are good ways of maintaining diversities. So it's a good point that's raised is that although we are showing all this for multimodal for the purpose of getting multiple solutions, but often we do that for single, uh, for single solution finding as well just to maintain diversity. It's all about maintaining diversity. One way is we are maintaining diversity is through initial population by having an adequate population size. One point, point based methods do not have that. So how big, a, how big a population size we need so that for this problem, I will have enough diversity. That thing I showed you, that it's a, usually there is a critical population size exist for every algorithm for a problem. But if you are doing it for, you know, like a software that you have, you are giving it to someone to use on a routine basis, you have to do that kind of analysis I showed you first and make that extensive study, find out where is the, that critical population size and ask them a little more. Uh, but if it's an academic problem, uh, that usually they discourage because then you are spending a lot of evaluations to find what is the optimal population size. But then if it's an academic problem, usually we don't use any custom information. It's a standard GA that we use. Random initialization of population what you use, so then you fall back to population size is proportional to number of variables and all that so that you continue with that right okay any other question related or something that you have done before you 
this one you need an additional termination condition. Um, so usually it is the rate at which your function value is improving. You see that if that rate has stopped growing at a more than a threshold rate, you say we stop. Okay? In multimodal, we are expecting, let us say, you thought you would get four solutions from this problem. Whether four optimum exist or not, you did not know, but say you set up four. Your sigma share will be sized based on that number. And so far you have got three. So you keep trying till you get four. But then you need an additional one. What if there is no fourth optima? So you have to just keep on forever to find that. So you need to also have another criteria then that says, okay, I am looking for four, but I will only go up to thousand generations, and more than that, I don't have time. So either if I get four before thousand, I will quit. If I don't get, I will go all the way up to thousand and stop. Okay, but there are some ways you can guess. For example. Um, if you see that the niche counts, okay. So here I have a population of size six, and I'm getting a niche count for some of the solutions that are, what is that? Two point four, three point zero, and three. So around three, I'm getting right. So this says that one of the optima here has itself and three more, three more point around it, and another one has one, just one itself, right? So um, you get an idea how many peaks there can be. So if you screen this, if you screen this fitness fitnesses and say, um, okay, the highest is 0 0.995, some I will look at all the solutions that are let's say 80 percent or more from that, and I look at it will probably be, except this one, everybody else. So there are five of them, and now I am saying what is the niche count of each of these five? I will see that they have, they have there is a connection these because when you are computing this, you can also know the connection, right? And then you are saying that there are actually two peaks that I am seeing. One that has nothing, it is isolated, and another that are all kind of linked together. So along the way, when you are computing niche count, you can get an idea how many peaks are there in your, in your population. Okay, and most likely that many peaks are there in the, in, the, in the problem. Then you can resize your sigma share, because you assumed four, but you are discovering that no, there is no four, there are only two. So you recalculate what should be sigma share and then set it up that way. So there are a lot of information here when you are computing. We are just doing it to calculate niche count, but you can also do to get an idea of how many peaks, which points are related to the peak, because every pair that has a non-zero value is close by. Okay? So they are all into same cluster. Okay? So then you can get an idea how many clusters I found in my, in my population, and that gives you an idea of number of peaks. Sure, sure. A priori information, yeah, yeah. So uh, sometimes, for example, you can have a problem where, um, let's say this kind of a function, x, I'm just giving an example. Actually, there is one, two, three, four peaks, okay? But these two are very close. So the way we size our sigma share, assuming that all peaks are uniformly spaced, because we have no idea about all, all of these, so best to assume that they are uniformly spaced. But if you assume 4, now the question is, if you put sigma share to be 4, can you get all the 4 or you will get one of the 2, maybe this one because this is better, this one and that one, and you will never get the fourth one. It could be because they are so close to it that you, you sized your sigma share in a way that both these are considered under one niche. Your, for this point, the sigma share value could not be this much, so everything under this is affecting its sharing, so and including this, and GA will consider this is one peak. So you will not be able to get that. How will you get this? If you still want to get that peak, sigma share has to be reduced. Okay. So there are several customization now you can think of here. Is one thing is is that I mean once I find this, I can then go and see that this is one cluster. This could be another cluster. This could be another cluster. Can I do a niching within the cluster? Okay, uh, if I think there would be another peak, so that can come from problem information. If not, there is no point doing that, right? So if it's a test problem given like this, I don't care whether I get two or one here. I mean, to me, they are all the same peak. Okay, so I will tell you that there are three peaks in this problem. But if this is a problem I'm solving and I need to really find these two, 
something should tell me that there is another small peak nearby, some problem information or something. Uh, that information I can use and say, okay, now I go to that niche and split it up and use a smaller sigma share there. I can use two levels of sigma share. First is the bigger level and then another level within the niche. All these kinds of stuff can come from problem information, but you don't want to do it unless you have to. Right? See, one nice thing about the evolutionary method is very flexible. You can do whatever you feel like. Uh, the whole framework is there. After that, it's just the points. We're not using gradient or any other restrictions. So you can do pretty much any kind of computation that you want to do. Yeah. Sir, here we are performing mean with respect to the optimal point. But if we all what? No, 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 no. Where is the optimal point? Is, uh, the local minimum. Uh, I've never used any optimal point. These are population values. Yeah. No, no, not from local minima I'm going. This is, if this is one of my population member, my population member can be here. Then I'm going sigma share either way from it. Yeah, I don't know where the optima is, so I don't, I cannot do that. It's always based on whatever is my, every point I'm going plus minus sigma, right? If you noticed all that, every point. So I'm also doing with this guy, which is the best one, and also that guy, which is the another side, I'm also going, but they may not be the optimum yet. But the whole algorithm starts with your population. And then it just looks around with plus minus sigma and puts and has this contribution like this. Okay, so if you are crowded, you will have a large value here. So your fitness will drop. Okay, if you are not crowded, this number is going to be close to one, and then you are not dropping much. So you are on one case, if you have two equal peak, on one case because of the crowding, you have dropped quite a bit. Another case, because of less crowding, you haven't dropped much. So this suddenly becomes important. So that means the less crowded one is considered important. So more points, it will have more selection uh, pressure. So more copies of that will be in the mating pool. So continue to distinguish the point 3 is more nearer to point 2. But still we are mm -hmm. considered it in the another cluster. Because the difference is probably, what is the difference between 3 and 2? It is within this niche. So, 3's niche is 2, yeah. So, 3 is affecting 2, okay? And 2 is also affecting 3 a little bit. But we, means, sir, but while calculating the shared one, we have select, uh, see the effect of 3 over the 4. No, 3 doesn't have an effect of 4, right? 4 is alone, 4 is 1. Uh, 3 is not within 0.5 of 4. Although it's in the same area, but I don't see that function when I'm doing optimization, right? I'm only computing function values at each of these points. That's all I see. It so happens that 3 is in this peak, but very poor solution. It's a little closer to 2 than it's 4. So it affects 2, but not 4. Uh, but that's how it is. I mean, so now that's what I was getting at, that if now there is an optima here, let's say, is a local optima here at 3, right? I will lose that information, right? So now, if I see that, okay, I need to be more refined here. For some reason, I know that information, that there may be an optima here. So then I can be a little more finer and reduce my sigma share. If I reduce my sigma share of 0 0.5 to 0.4, then 3 is not sharing with anybody. So 3 is alone. So 3's fitness will not be divided by anything more than 1, right? So 3 remains what it is. If 3 has a high value, like if this was like this, let's say, 3 was a high value, it will stay. Because it has a high value, it is dividing by 1, so it stays. Maybe this one still stays best, this will be second best, and all these are third best. So then you can get 3 also. right? So it just depends on the situation and what sigma share you have chosen. Sigma share is something we set from before, doesn't mean we have to keep it all along. Every generation we can change it, provided we get any information. So that information can be arrived from this or this information can come as a customized information of how to choose sigma share. Okay? Okay, you first. So, in a schema theorem, uh, there is this one term called del h. So, like how do we get that? Which theorem you are saying? The schema theorem. Del h? Oh, delta h. That is the defining length. It is the difference between two outermost defined bits. It's called defining length, defining length. Okay, it's used in the crossover operator because if a crossover site falls within that defining length, you are destroying. 
just showing that schema. So that, that's why it appears in the crossover term, if you see the delta H. You had a question? No, 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 completely different. But we use this niching in multi-objective optimization. That's why I want to do this first before I go to multi-objective. Because this idea is to find multiple solutions. In multi-objective, also our goal is to find multiple solutions. And we use niching to maintain multiple solutions. This is one way you find and maintain multiple solutions. As I said, maintain means as soon as something is getting depleted, suddenly selection pressure goes up. So you can maintain it all along. You can run thousands, ten thousands generations. You're never going to lose any of the peaks. We use this principle. We use that in multi-object, which we'll start tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, two optimal point is here. Smart sine x or this sine square x. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now second time, uh, with new random number generator, again I have the same time. If I get the <coughs> second optimal point, then, then also I can say that this is a multiple number. Yeah. Yeah. But then you have to run multiple times. Yeah. And there is no guarantee every time you run, you get a different optima. Yeah. Maybe I get the same optima. Yeah. Maybe many of the times you get the same optima. All these we are reducing, saying one time you run with sharing, and you will get both the peaks one time when you run. So you need algorithms like this, not, you don't have to try again and again, right? So what do you have to change in your algorithm so that you get this? This is one of the ways, as I said, there are other methods also. Any other question? No? Okay. Then we'll close our shop today. <laughs> and tomorrow we start at 9.30 again, multi-objective will start, okay? And tomorrow,